Well, it's great to come to order and good afternoon. I want to thank each of you for joining us uh, again today as we meet to consider two important pieces of legislation. First, the committee will consider H.R. 4015, the SGR Repeal and Medicare Provider Payment Modernization Act. This bipartisan bill represents the culmination of years of work by the Energy and Commerce Committee, Ways and Means Committees, and many of our physician community members including a member of this committee, the Honorable Michael Burgess, who has been deeply involved in this issue, issue since becoming a member of Congress. We are seeking to protect the solvency of Medicare to ensure that our nation's seniors continue to have access to quality health care. And I believe unless Congress takes immediate action, Medicare providers will see a nearly 24 percent reduction in their reimbursement rates. Such a reduction would reduce seniors' access to health care and jeopardize the entire system of Medicare as we know it. Today's legislation creates a long-term solution to this growing problem by replacing SGR and replacing with, with common sense reforms to improve patient outcomes and to reduce wasteful spending. Next, the committee will consider H.R. 3189, the Water Rights Protection Act. This bipartisan piece of legislation takes important steps to prevent the federal government from forcing, and I use the word forcing, individuals and business to relinquish their private water rights in order to qualify for federal permits or land use. Disturbingly, there have been reports that highlight a growing trend of federal government agencies extorting water rights from private citizens before a permit will be granted to access federal lands. As this committee has heard, water rights are paramount to economic growth and vitality, especially in Western states. Certainly, we recognize and know that the front range of Colorado is perhaps a, also a center point of this discussion. The federal government has no right to force anyone to forfeit their private water rights in exchange for access for federal permits. I believe, and I believe this legislation, including the author of this bill, will clearly point that out today. I think this legislation proposes a common sense solution. I appreciate the Natural Resources Committee for their work on this important piece of legislation. I want to thank my colleagues for taking time to be at this important hearing today. And uh, our, we are moving together. Uh, with unanimous consent by our friends who are very busy today, who are Democrats. Uh, and I want to welcome uh, to the uh, table, if we can please, the gentleman, Michael Burgess, uh, physician, member of the uh, Rules Committee, as well as a chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and the gentleman, Gene Green, also from Texas, Energy, a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. As each of you know, uh, this committee relies upon not just your testimony as expert witness testimony, but also we respect and appreciate you for the hard work which you have provided to this great nation, your party, uh, and our Congress. Uh, and today, you being here is a high water mark, I believe, to talk about a possible hopeful deal that we can get done without ex exception. Uh, objection, anything you have in writing will be entered in the record. Dr. Burgess, we're delighted that you're here, and I would remind each of you to please remember to move that mic close to you, turn it on. Dr. Burgess, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is, uh, I mean, this is a big deal, and I appreciate you letting me testify. Certainly, thank you for the opportunity to bring the text to 4015 before the Rules Committee. This is something upon which I have been working since I very first arrived in Congress. During that time, our nation's doctors have wondered if the sword of Damocles would fall on their heads and one day would they would receive that massive cut that the sustainable growth rate formula dictates. Many providers have limited or given up seeing Medicare patients. It's hurt the stability of the program. It's threatened access to care. H.R. 4015 represents the long work of the committees of jurisdiction and let me stress, Mr. Chairman, we have worked in a bipartisan and bicameral fashion over two years' time to get this done. This is the most transparent Medicare reform process ever undertaken by the committees. 
in my tenure and possibly ever. We have solicited feedback from stakeholders, yes, doctors, but patient groups as well, at every step along the way. We've held hearing after hearing. We on the Energy and Commerce Committee worked in consultation with Ways and Means and Senate Finance. We've released white papers. We've released legislative drafts. Every time we received feedback and we compiled helpful and realistic suggestions and incorporated them into the product. Everyone agrees that Medicare's sustainable growth rate has got to go, and today we're considering the actual framework to realistically accomplish that goal. Since 2002, the formula has called for a reduction to physician reimbursement rates. Every year, Congress has passed an override to the sustainable growth rate formula. This has led this body to find over $150 billion and yet provide for no solution to this annual mess. If Congress were to let the sustainable growth rate formula go into effect, physicians would face a 24% reduction in reimbursement on April 1st. The bill before us repeals the formula, avoiding the potentially devastating across-the-board cuts slated for 2014, and it does so at a cost far lower than what Congress has already spent or would likely spend over the next 10 years. H.R. 4015 is what we have in a bipartisan, bicameral process. We've put forth as a legislative proposal to repeal the SGR and improve Medicare for future beneficiaries. Mr. Chairman, let me just say I know there is disagreement about the pay for, and it has been suggested that, <clears throat> that there's no question that the next step in this process must be taken, showing that the policy does have support of a majority of the House. We need to engage in substantive bipartisan bicameral dialogue for pay force that can get this policy into law. But Mr. Chairman, in order to have that negotiation, there has to be a willing negotiation partner. This language, the policy language, was substantially agreed upon at the end of September, at the 1st of February, right before Mr. Bacchus left the other body to be the ambassador to China. Since that time, there has been radio silence out of the majority leader's office in the Senate. Mr. Chairman, I can only negotiate with myself so far. At some point, I have to have input from the other side. Well, Mr. Chairman, today we're bringing a bill to the floor, and it embodies the policy that has been embraced by Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, Senate Finance, the chairman and ranking members of all the three committees of jurisdiction have agreed to the policy. So let's talk about what we all can agree upon. We repeal the SGR, provide a period of transition. We preserve fee-for-service in medicine. I think that's important. We've reduced the administrative burden by building off of systems that providers are already using. We encourage maximum alignment with regard to provider reporting. We put medicine back in the driver's seat of working with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to develop quality measures guided by best clinical practices. That's what we always say we always want. We allow individual practices to decide measures that best fit their practice. We create an additional pathway to test models and enhance care and reduce cost. No one got everything that they wanted but we are all getting what we desire, moving forward a product that after far too long has languished. The original co-sponsors of this bill include the chairman and ranking members of the full committees of jurisdiction as well as the health subcommittees. This bill has gained support of the GOP Doctors Caucus as well as many of the physicians on the other side of the dais. We have over 100 bipartisan co-sponsors. The bill's policy has been embraced by organized medicine, with over 700 state and national groups who have written their support for the bill. From primary care to specialists to surgeons to organized nursing, every, and everyone in between supports this policy. So Mr. Chairman, this is an important day. I look forward to the passage and continuing this process with the other body, but to embrace the underlying policy and ultimately identify the offsets that will get this badly needed policy into law. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer questions from the committee. Dr. Burgess, thank you very much, not only for your expert testimony, but also your years 
worth of service ever since I met you, probably the first day I met you, I knew you spoke about this. Mr. Green, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, obviously, having two Texans uh, up here today is important to, uh, I think, lots of people, but you come with years of service to the Energy and Commerce Committee. And if I could have you wait just one moment, please, and I would like to yield such time for the, the gentleman from Florida if he wishes to make an opening statement. Gentleman's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I have no opening statement. Thank you very much. We always make sure, Gene, that uh, that uh, we try and accommodate everybody up here as best as possible. And sometimes it's possible, and other times it's necessary. And, and the judge and I intend to get along on these measures. So without objection, gentlemen's recognized. Thank you. And I'm glad to have all the Texans here. We don't have to have interpretation of what we have to say here. Uh, uh, well, Oklahoma might need it. <laughs> uh, First of all, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I'm honored to be here at the Rules Committee. I don't come very often, um, but um, I'm a co-sponsor of the original H.R. 4015, and I support the permanent repeal of the SGR. It's passed out of our Energy and Commerce Committee by, by unanimous consent. Um, but my objection is using the Affordable Care Act individual responsibility requirement as the payment for the SGR reform is a slap in the face of our medical community. This move hijacks a thoughtful process and uh, thoughtful solution to a problem that has been harming Medicare beneficiaries, providers, and our budget for years, and it's turned into another political stunt. This decision is a poison pill and nothing more than partisan theater. Congress has overridden the SGR, as my colleague said, mandated cuts in Medicare physician payments each year since 2003. Year after year, the temporary patches have been costly and disruptive. Reforming the system is is long overdue, and temporary fixes to the SGR are a lose-lose since it has to be offset by other cuts and only to maintain the broken status quo. The bipartisan, bicameral cameral SGR bill is the closest we've come to fixing this problem once and for all, and now my concern is our majority is it may be throwing it away. Repealing the ACA is a game we play now for the 51st time. Holding the SGR reform hostage to destroy the ACA uh, denies millions of Americans access to health insurance is actually disgraceful. Our seniors and the doctors who treat them and the American people deserve better. In order for our health care system to work, Americans must have insurance. Delaying or repealing the requirement that individuals obtain coverage would drive up premiums and leave millions uninsured. Again, this is a purely political uh, partisan pay for. Uh, this is not a sincere effort to enact H SGR reform, but rather just another political game. Um, this poison pill offset for this bipartisan uh, Medicare bill has drawn widespread opposition. Here are some of the groups who have opposed this effort. The American Medical Association, AARP, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American College of Surgeons, the American Osteopathic Association, the American College of Physicians, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, America's Health Insurance Plans, California Medical Association, the Texas Medical Association, National Association of Spine Specialists, and those are just a few. That's why, Mr. Chairman, given that strong opposition to the poison pill offset, we ask that a substitute be made in order so the Democrats can offer an alternative that would provide an offset that does not cause 13 million Americans to lose their insurance coverage. And again, I was proud to be a co-sponsor of the bill, one of the 100, and um, that came out of our committee, like I said, unanimous. And um, but I would hope that um, this pay for would not be used. We need to fix GSGR, need to fix it permanently, and passing a clean bill would actually do that. And again, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Mr. Green, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your testimony to us today. Uh, Dr. Burgess, there uh, has been a lot said now and over the last few days about paying for this change that needs to be done. Um, our colleagues that voted for the uh, Affordable Care Act took $700 billion out of senior health care, what is called Medicare, uh, and used it to pay for others instead of seniors. Uh, t tell me about the difficulty that physicians are having now by seeing huge amounts of money come out. Uh, I, as you, I know, I know you're not in full-time practice now, but 
my parents uh, and other people's parents, seniors, are having problems because they're not able to, to uh, find the services that they did just a year ago. Uh, and this, this is a continuing problem well, to me. I, sorry. So that's, that's, I, you know more about these issues and problems, but the $700 billion that Democrats and President Obama took out of senior care continues to, to exacerbate the problem. There's no question that it does, and it will exacerbate it much in a much greater way in, in, in the years to come. The SGR is separate and apart it is. from the Affordable Care Act, and the cuts that are coming through the SGR are coming independent. Of the affordable. They would have come if the Affordable Care Act had not been there. But something, and, and you correctly identify why this problem is so pressing, because it is a, an access issue for our Medicare patients to get to see a physician. And we all know what happens if you delay care. It gets more expensive and more complicated. So it, this does need to be fixed. I do not know why the majority leader of the other body is opposed to fixing this problem. But, Mr. Chairman, I just have to tell you, I've got no, I have no other, there, there's no other thought that you can have other than that the majority leader of the United States Senate does not want doctors to have this fixed. Now, I appreciate my friend bringing letters from various medical organizations, but let's be honest about what's happening here. The American Medical Association put the stamp of approval on the Affordable Care Act. If you want my opinion, fixing the SGR was the missing link. If you say you're going to change health care in this country from soup to nuts, why wouldn't you fix the sustainable growth rate formula? Why wouldn't you fix liability? Why wouldn't you allow doctors to negotiate? I mean, there are lots of things that were left out, but the SGR is the most glaring omission. So today, we have an opportunity to fix that. Now, look, the president delayed the imposition of the individual mandate or, or the date by which that was going to go into effect by six weeks from February 14th to March 31st. Yesterday on the House floor, almost unanimously, we gave volunteer firefighters an exemption from the individual mandate. We gave veterans an exemption from the individual mandate. Last week, the House voted with 27 Democrats voting with Republicans to delay the individual mandate. We're talking about freedom here. America, the American people should have the same freedom that we're willing to give to select other populations. And in doing so, it actually scores as a saving by the Congressional Budget Office. And all we are saying is, since we have a policy upon which we both agree, and it's apparent that we do agree on the policy, and the majority leader of the United States Senate refuses to come and talk to us about what our possible potential pay for is, we have one sitting in front of us, staring us in the face, the missing link from the Affordable Care Act. So the suggestion is we take that. 27 Democrats supported that last week, almost unanimous for veterans and firefighters yesterday. Why not take that that is available to us and move this discussion forward? Because it is not moving forward with the majority leader of the United States Senate as it stands now. We've had this policy out available for all to see, all committee chairs signing off on it, all ranking members signing off on it for almost a month. And we've had no credible discussions with the majority leader in the United States Senate. Now, I recognize that the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee changed over that time, but it is the majority leader of the United States Senate who has taken the lead on these negotiations, and he won't answer our phone calls. So I would just ask you, what are we supposed to do? Continue to negotiate with ourselves and till perhaps by happenstance we come upon something that's acceptable to him? That's not the way this works. That's not the way the constitutional form of government was set up in this country. We are proposing a bill to come to the floor, which is fully offset, fully paid for. If it passes, I'm hopeful that it will reopen those negotiations with the Senate. I recognize what's going on here. When I visualize a fix to the SGR, and I promise you I have visualized that many times over the last 12 years, I don't envision dropping a bill. I envision a signing ceremony in the White House that the bill is finally signed that alleviates this burden from our seniors and for those who provide for their care. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Bishop. Do I have a chance to respond? Excuse me. Just one moment, please. Does the gentleman wish to seek time to offer? I did not ask the gentleman a okay. question. Did you wish to? Well, I just like to mention a couple 
points. One, the Affordable Care Act that passed the House permanently fixed the SGR, and it was paid for. Also, since the uh, Affordable Care Act has passed, and I'm concerned about seniors as much as anyone else, the ACA, um, since the ACA passed, Medicare Advantage premiums have gone down 10 percent, and enrollment is up 30 percent. And I just wanted to mention that. So, uh, and I support the SGR fix, but I don't support, and I think it's turned into, um, uh, it will make it hard passing Congress with the pay for on it. But that's the committee, committee's decision. Mr. Green, I was going to uh, pass my, to the next member. You said SGR was fixed with uh, the Affordable Care Act? We had a permanent fix in the House bill of oh, the Affordable Care Act. But now, that was never we don't, voted on. I, I, I don't have a vote in the Senate. But the House bill that passed had a permanent fix for the SGR. Okay, but it never became law. No. Did not become law. Mr. Chairman, just Dr. I'm Burgess. Sorry, hey, if I may continue the history, if you'll recall, then the majority leader of the United States Senate brought up a separate SGR bill, knowing he did not have the votes on his side, knowing he did not have the votes, and it failed. And he said, well, I did everything I could to fix the SGR, and he walked away from it. So our bill was dead on arrival when it got over to the Senate for that reason, because you could not pay for everything you wanted to pay for in the Affordable Care Act unless you had the cuts provided by the sustainable growth rate. I'll yield back. That's, that's right, at least as I recall it. Gentleman from uh, Utah's recognized. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Massachusetts recognized. Yeah, I, listen, I, I, I'm, always, I'm, I'm getting to get to the point where I'm at a loss of words um, because I cannot believe how this, uh, how this process is unfolded, unfolding here. I mean, this is an important issue. I think we can, come, that we can get to a bipartisan solution in terms of the, the pay-fors. We ought to do that and not go through this crazy dance that we're going through right now. And I, I just, you know, I, you know, from the stuff that we, we're, we're dealing with right now on the floor to this, I mean, this, there's a better way to do this. And I think we should come to an accommodation with the Senate on the pay-fors. Clearly, you know, what, what the pay-for is here is, is, is dead on arrival. Um, everybody knows that. I don't know why anybody thinks that uh, it's worth going through this. I mean, maybe, maybe you get political points back in, in your district. I don't know. But this is not the way we should be legislating. And I think... You know, I think everybody wants to get the SGR fixed, and uh, we ought to do that. I, you know, I, I think there's a bipartisan way to do it. But, 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 if I could yeah. respond, the bills that passed out of the bill that passed out of the Energy and Commerce Committee was unanimous. Right. It did not have the provision in there for the pay fors to delay the individual mandate. Um, we don't have jurisdiction in Energy and Commerce over pay fors. That was Ways and Means, um, but. You know, that's why it has unanimous support, and I think that's why I read earlier a list of medical associations who are opposing this fix, um, uh, the, the pay for in this bill, including the American Medical Association, the Texas Medical Association, a whole list of them. We can do better. So, so we're taking a bipartisan bill and turning it into a partisan document, essentially, uh, which I'm, I, I assume the Republicans have been whipped into making sure they all vote for it, but then it goes then it, then it goes nowhere. I mean, it just it just seems that a, a more thoughtful approach. And again, I, I'm, I will tell you, one of the things that I heard when I was home from people were that they were getting very discouraged by the fact that um, they don't think that we can act like grown-ups in this place anymore. Um, and I think the grown-up thing to do once you have a bipartisan bill is to work in a bipartisan way to find acceptable pay-fors so that we can do this right uh, and not play these games anymore. I, I just I think people are getting really tired of it. So anyway, I thank you for being here and yield back my time. Mr. Chairman, may I respond? All right. Jill, does the gentleman wish to maintain his time? And, I, I maintain my time and I'll, I'll respond to the gentleman. I'll let the gentleman respond. Well, first off, let me just say I'm offended by the notion that I would push this policy out there for political gain at home. But I would remind the gentleman from Massachusetts that this policy has been out there for a month, for four full weeks, and we've gotten no response from the Senate Majority Leader 
on what he would like to do as far as proceeding with the next steps for bipartisan pay-fors. We can only negotiate with ourselves so long. I think this is a reasonable approach. 27 members on the Democratic side last week voted to delay the individual mandate. Almost unanimous vote yesterday to delay the individual mandate for firefighters and for veterans. Our commitment has been to permanently repeal the sustainable growth rate formula. This is a way forward. Yeah. We, we cannot bring the bill to the floor without without it being paid for, with, and everyone with, understands I that. my time. With respect, uh, Mr. Burgess, um, this pay-for that you have right uh, that you have attached to this, this bill right now, to, uh, was there a markup on this? Um, I mean, I think you, you talk about negotiating with Harry Reid. How about negotiating with some of the Democrats that are in are, uh, the, the Democrats sitting next to you? And was there a markup on, on the, on the pay-for? Or here. Or, he, or you know, in, in here. The... Uh, well, the bill actually passed on the floor of the House. Yeah, I, yeah, I, guess, I guess the point I was trying to make is there was, no, there was no markup on the bill that we're debating here today. That was in Ways and Means Committee. I'm not right, a member of that committee. You, you, we've attached a, a pay for here, right? Mr. I, Campus, I believe it's an amendment. An amendment. An, well, yeah. I, it would seem to me that, again, maybe I'm losing it here, but it seems to me that you had a bipartisan product that, 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 that you know, originated in your committee, right? It was passed by a unanimous, a unanimous, unanimous, unanimous vote unanimous out of the Energy vote. Commerce Committee. It, it, you know, it would seem to me that you would try to work with some of the Democrats here in the House to see whether you could come up with, you know, maybe a unanimous way to pay for this thing. Um, and, you know, and, and, it's, and, and look, at it, and I'm sorry you're offended by this, but I can't possibly imagine the, be, the, the, the benefit of, of using this pay for uh, for this bill, other than politics, I, I, I mean, it, it, it just it defies logic, quite frankly. And I'm just, again, we're wasting our time when we when we should be negotiating with one another. And that's what people are getting sick and tired of in this place is that you know we it, everything is a political document. It would be nice, maybe, if the committees, the relevant committees, got together here and talk sensibly about a, a bipartisan pay for. I mean, maybe that's too much to ask. Well, I don't disagree. If if I may, I don't disagree, but remember there are three committees involved. Mr. Green and I are Energy and Commerce. Ways and Means is the other committee. The other committee is the Senate Finance Committee. And when they will not talk to us, it is impossible to get an agreement between all three committees. Well, I would say it is not, a, it uh, is not uh, something that can be done by a, a single committee, even if there's a commitment uh, yeah. from both sides. Gentleman from Texas. Well, let me just read some of the quotes. I'll start with the Wall Street Journal urges Congress to forego partisan offsets. And the Wall Street Journal suggests that Congress simply pass the bill as it is and forego the pretense of fake paying for it. Uh, the California Medical Association calls on Congress to return to the negotiating table to build on a bipartisan process and identify bipartisan funding offsets, which we didn't in the House. The Texas Medical Association says Washington is up to its old partisan tricks. House Republican leaders know their plan has zero chance of passing the Democrat-controlled Senate or earning President Obama's signature. And I have other quotes, if, if you'd like to hear from them, from medical associations about this situation, uh, the, this pay for look particularly. At, I, I appreciate it. And look, at, I, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Burgess's uh, critique of the Senate. I, there are lots of things I like to critique about the Senate as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think before we start criticizing the Senate, we ought to be looking in the mirror and figuring out how we can do this better. And, I don't, and, and, and coming to this committee with a bill that was bipartisan and now is clearly partisan, I don't think is the way we should proceed. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I yield back my time. Chairman yields back his time. And um, I, I, I would remind the committee that what the gentleman is here to do is to try and pass a piece of legislation with the first shot at trying to get this to a conference committee to where they can come up and resolve the differences. Uh, and that, I think, is what Dr. Burgess is trying to do. And with with respect to Mr. Green, I think he supports that same issue and idea to move this forward to where we can make this well, the permanent gentleman, law. The gentleman yield? I, I would yield to the gentleman. I mean, this expires March 31st? Right. That, that's, so, that's correct, sir. Yeah, yes. So, so we, we, you know, it would seem to me we could save a lot of time, you know, if we, again, worked in a bipartisan way rather than passing something here, passing over there, and then go to a conference committee. I, 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 just, I just pointed out that there's got to be a better way to do this. I, you know, and, and I, 
engaging the gentleman, while, while I do agree with you, one of the ways is to try and engage the Senate. And I think that's what we're attempting to do today. And I would uh, provide feedback to both of these gentlemen who've worked hard on this, that that's what our hope is by you coming to the Rules Committee today so that we can appropriately get our work done and put you on a mission uh, that would allow you to do work to find the compromise, to find whatever it might be with the Senate because they've been unable to up to now. Thank you very much. But I, I, I don't want to throw each of you to the wolves to say you, you're, that you would not try and do that because I think that's what the effort's for. Chairman Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. I gather since it passed out of the committee unanimously in terms of the policy, there's not any difference on a partisan line between on the policy to pay for, clearly there is, but I assume the policy has pretty much been worked out. Okay. I, I, I agree. It and was. answer that question is yes. Yeah. Okay. We're both, co it's Mike's bill, but I'm a co-sponsor. <laughs> Great. I'd uh, always love to see Texans work together except in football season. But, uh, um, second, uh, you'd be very dangerous if you guys were ever united in football. Um, if uh, and this is probably an unfair question, but uh, on the Senate side, has there been any movement at all in terms of reaching a pay for? Mr. Cole, if I may, there was sign off of all three committee chairmen of the three relevant committees, including Senate Finance, right before Mr. Bacchus's departure. All three ranking members on the committees signed off on the, on the policy. It has languished for four weeks. We have been at the table, ready to go, ready to have the discussions on pay for us, recognizing that some of them are going to be painful. Some of them could be partisan, but ready to go. And for four weeks, radio silence. Now, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee did change during that interval. But it is my understanding that the majority leader in the United States Senate has said he is in charge of these negotiations. We await their input, and to date, nothing. Mr. Green, do you have a... Well, as far as I know, uh, Senator Reid and the Senate Democrats support SGR for form, and, but this is not the way to get a bill signed into law. And Democrats will not pay for the SGR by hurting the 13 million beneficiaries uh, who would lose coverage. But let me quote a former Speaker of the House that actually was closer to your district than it is mine in Houston. Uh, Sam Rayburn, when he visited a number of, uh, uh, he, Sam Rayburn from Northeast Texas, and he told a, a group of incoming new members that uh, that person next to you, your Republicans or Democrat, that person next to you may be your adversary, but the Senate's the enemy. And I think that's probably, we see that today, but we need the Senate to respond um, to it. But as far as I know, Senator Reid and the Senators, Democratic Senators support SGR reform. But by sending this bill over there, it will delay reform on the SGR, and that's why the laundry list of medical associations, I think, are opposing this method of pay for it. Uh, I've, I've been told, and again, I'd, I'd let either of you feel free to comment or not on this, that, that the Senate's position is really they just want to do it without paying for it, uh, and that won't pass over here, if, if that's the case. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, this is an easy bill for me to vote for, obviously, but I understand why it would be difficult if I were a Democrat and had voted for Obamacare. I get that. On the other hand, it seems to me we're just doing the process. That is, we're actually passing a bill and ready to go to conference. And maybe that will put some pressure on our friends on the Senate side to come up with their own pay for, which I have no doubt would be different, and go to a conference. And then, you know, the conferees will, will uh, haggle it out. And my guess is it would come out something different than what the Senate put in and what the House put in. But if, you know, if we don't get the thing moving at some point and – you know, in some ways, to have to negotiate twice, first with the Democrats here, then with the Democrats in the Senate, is pretty tough, too. So, I don't know, I, I, think, uh, I think you're moving ahead in an appropriate manner. I mean, this is what I would suspect the majority of this House would favor if it could write a bill. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the Senate would favor something else. They just need to write a bill and go to conference. Yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hastings, Judge Thank Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman. I'd like to revisit the subject of the history of this measure and allow that I believe that the House uh, version of 
health reform did repeal SGR. Am I correct about that, Mr. Cooper? That's correct. We paid for the repeal of SGR in the House Affordable Care Act. And am I correct that we voted twice to repeal the SGR and not undermine all the other reforms? I don't remember how many times we voted, but I know we, we did. <laughs> um, I can uh, assure you. Um, Mr. Chairman, let me ask you a question. I hear uh, Dr. Burgess and everybody else that has spoken at this point, but would it not be our responsibility here in the Rules Committee uh, to follow regular order? And where in our rules does uh, negotiating with the Senate majority or uh, allow for us uh, to be dealing here with regular order? You know, I, I'm going to attempt, and I thank the gentleman for engaging me. I, I think what Dr. Burgess, and you really could talk with Dr. Burgess, I've not been involved in these negotiations, but I believe what's happened is that there was a bipartisan, bicameral, multi-jurisdictional issue, meaning Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce discussion between the two bodies that then brought itself forward. Okay, we, we got the policy where we could agree on it. And that was, a, that was an amazing feat, perhaps. Right. Then the question Although comes... Although it's hard to find anybody who's for the SGR, in all honesty. Well, in, in honesty, okay, that's right. But you still got to want to work on things. And it was done together. Policy is one thing, and then the other thing is how you're going to pay for it. And uh, all I'm suggesting to you is I believe that what Dr. Burgess was suggesting was there was an attempt, and I believe the Senate Majority Leader is entitled to, to handle this the way he chooses to. We're going to try and take what comes before this committee, provide it to the floor. If it passes, the Speaker can make a decision to send it on and appoint conferees. This is a serious issue, and, and Understood. we don't always negotiate uh, openly. And I'm not suggesting that the Senate Majority Leader, Mr. Reed, should be doing that. All that I'm saying is there was an attempt to do that to forge a, uh, an agreement. I fully appreciate yes, sir. All, I, all I yield your back answer, to gentlemen. Mr. Chairman. My problem is, and continues in spite of what you said, ought to believe that we are not operating here in the Rules Committee and on the House side under regular order. I would ask Mr. Green, was there a markup or a hearing regarding this particular matter before us today? The number HR 4015, we had hearings and, and a markup, and it passed unanimously. The pay for was not in the Energy and Commerce Bill, and as far as I know, it wasn't in the Ways and Means provision either. All right. Well, Dr. Burgess, you are asking for an open discussion on particularly as it pertains to this measure, without any markup or hearing, and uh, self-executing in the final analysis what is a partisan uh, solution. Uh, you say, and I heard you say it uh, twice, um, uh, that it's difficult to negotiate with yourself, and then you cite to efforts to speak with uh, the majority leader. Uh, but House Democrats have some ideas uh, for uh, pay-fors, um, and we have one in the form of a substitute offered uh, by Mr. Tierney, um, and it's submitted uh, here today. Was there any effort on your behalf, uh, Dr. Burgess, to uh, reach out and find uh, a real solution uh, that could be um, uh, a bipartisan one? And Mr. Tierney's measure specifically uh, which provides a permanent fix uh, to the SGR, and he pays for it, I might add, uh, by capping spending on overseas contingency operations. While I personally may disagree with that as a pay-for, at least it is something that could have, and I believe should have, been considered. So my question to you is, did you reach out uh, to either Mr. Turney or anyone else um, uh, to discuss other potential pay for? There have been active negotiations going on between the three committees of jurisdiction and their staffs for the last four weeks. The problem with offsetting with the overseas contingency operation money is that it's not real. 
So the Congressional Budget Office has advised that there would not be a score that would be usable for an offset for anything. So the overseas contingency operation, in my opinion, is, is dead on arrival. Mr. Tierney wants to make that as a motion for your motion to recommit. Well and good. He should have the opportunity to do so. But I would remind the gentleman from Florida, this problem does come to us under a deadline. The House voted last December to grant a stay of execution for the nation's doctors until March 31st. We are rapidly accomplishing the days when that will be delivered. Unfortunately, after there was substantial agreement between all three committees of jurisdiction, House and Senate, Republican and Democrat, there has been no movement. There exists a deadline that is rapidly approaching, which does require that we take some action. Now, if we simply decide, well, it, this is not important, and we'll just simply delay, and we'll do another patch, I would remind the gentleman that every time we do a patch, it is money that we have to get from somewhere. So that offset then works against whatever offset we may ever come, we may eventually come up with to pay for the repeal. So it is damaging to the ultimate repeal of the sustainable growth rate formula to continue to patch and delay. We've done that every year that I've been here for over 11 years. We've more than paid for what the Congressional Budget Office scores as a full repeal for the sustainable growth rate formula. In fact, we could repeal the sustainable growth rate formula and give doctors a 2% bonus and pay for that with the money that we've spent the last 10 years in patching the sustainable growth rate. So there is a cost to delay. And that is why I think it is important that this issue do come to the floor. Uh, if the Senate would like to offer what they have, and bring it to a conference committee, as the chairman suggested, I think that's an excellent way forward. I'll take that as a very long no, because I asked you whether or not you had any input from Mr. Tierney. Um, well, the short answer to that question is, in fact, no. Mr. I have not talked to Mr. Tierney about this. Well, he is welcome to offer, and I'm assuming that a motion to recommit will be made in order. Right, I have no problems with the fact that um, you finally gave me the short answer, no, and what I was trying to suggest to you was in an effort to achieve bipartisanship, it might be helpful if we as members of the House of Representatives were to spend some of our time trying to discuss matters with each other on either side of the aisle in order to achieve a real uh, uh, solution. Uh, you voted, Dr. Burgess, in 09 uh, for the SGR bill, and there was no pay for in that uh, particular measure, as a, for example. Uh, now, let me um, uh, say to you that earlier it was said um, here on the floor that the Democratic bill uh, that was passed was dead on arrival at the Senate, and much was made, <clears throat> or at least some chuckle uh, came about the fact that a Democratic uh, bill was dead on arrival at the Senate. Well, then why are you doing something here today that's self-executing and partisan that is going to be dead on arrival at the Senate. Do you not perceive that as a waste of time? Well, if you'll go back to the history of the Affordable Care Act, which I assume is what we're discussing in November of 2009, yes, the House did pass a bill. Uh, yes, it went over to the Senate, and there it died. And the Senate Finance Committee came up with an alternate bill, and they passed it on Christmas Eve, and that came over to the House. Um, because of a change in Senate makeup after that bill had passed the Senate. It apparently was felt that there were no longer the 60 votes necessary for cloture to bring any changes to that bill, and the House was then required to pass the Senate bill as is. I don't know whether that's right or not. I was not a member of the Democratic leadership. I can only imagine Lyndon Johnson saying he can't do Medicare because he lacks a single vote for cloture, somehow he'd have found a way to get it. But nevertheless, that was the situation that evolved. Uh, the Senate did not include an SGR repeal as part of 3590, which was a bill they passed on Christmas Eve. 
The Senate Majority Leader, as I recall, said, I will offer an opportunity to repeal the sustainable growth rate formula. He brought it to the floor rather quickly, and it failed. It failed with Democrats voting no on that bill. So, yes, there was an opportunity. Yes, it did fail. I think we're going about things differently. We are passing a bill in the House, passing it, and... Uh, the Speaker sending it over to the Senate, let them pass a bill, we'll go to conference committee. That is the way it should work. That is not regular order uh, either, Dr. Burgess. And, uh, there are innumerable options that could serve as a non-controversial pay for, uh, such as the one that I mentioned earlier by Mr. Uh, attorney today. Uh, but of course, my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, choose an option that would certainly uh, sink this bill. Um, the vernacular allows that we say, look, I get it. Uh, your side does not agree with the individual mandate. Then bring up another standalone bill to handle that issue, but please, please, don't close the process and self-execute a poison pill into what is undoubtedly one of the best pieces of legislation that we've considered so far in this Congress. Let's grant this an open rule uh, and find a pay-for solution that could work for both sides. Uh, I'll make a prediction for you, Dr. Burgess. Uh, March 31st, you may call it a patch or what have you, but I believe that we will do something uh, for uh, uh, the fix that I perceive, as do you, as vitally necessary. But I do wish to make a correction for you about something that you said, that Democrats don't want a fix, and I quote you, um, uh, for uh, this, and you're wrong, at least about Mr. Green and about me, uh, because like you, I believe that physicians are entitled uh, to have this matter uh, considered uh, by uh, this Congress. But what physicians and everybody in this nation needs to understand is this Congress is pretty much dead on its own arrival, and totally dysfunctional at this point. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman uh, from Florida is recognized, Mr. Nugent. The gentleman has no question. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify with Mr. Burgess, was H.R. 4015 marked up by committee? There was a precedent bill that was marked up in both subcommittee and full committee. The what was the first part you said? There was a precedent bill. I, right now, I forget the bill number. Of course. 2810. Uh, so I, uh, yes, but, but 4515 itself, the bill before us, is it correct that it was not marked up in committee? Well, 2810 was marked up in committee in the Energy and that's, Commerce Committee. That, it was marked up in the Ways and Means well, Committee. That's a, different, As, that's a different number. We assign each bill its own number here. So my question is very specifically, was H.R. 4015 marked up? in any committee of the House of Representatives. 4015 was an amalgamation of the House and Senate bills. So, I, well, we're claiming my time. I, 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 it's factual. I looked, I looked it up on, uh, on, on, to, on Thomas.gov here. H.R. 4015 uh, had, just had no, no committee action. Um, I'll submit that to the record without objection. H.R. 4015 was not marked up by committee. Uh, the reason that that's, that's relevant is because of the uh, ongoing accusations hurled against folks on my side of the aisle with regard to the Affordable Care Act and the process that surrounded it. Uh, the facts are that the House held 100 hours of hearings and 83 hours of committee markups on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, 239 amendments were considered in three committees of jurisdiction, 121 of which were adopted. The final bill, just as in this case, uh, underwent a pre similar procedural process uh, before it was considered by the House and had a different number, but it is exactly to the same uh, attack uh, that Republicans have made on that process that is exactly consistent with this process, where we have a bill, H.R. 4015, that was not the subject of a single hearing or a single moment of markup in any committee <coughs> of jurisdiction. And I think we just need to be a little bit more uh, 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 consistent here with, with how we approach that. If that's how 
you, the majority party, are going to do business, don't attack us, the minority party, for when we were in the majority party and did the same thing. Um, and if you are going to attack us for doing that, then it's perfectly fair for us to talk about how this bill has never had a markup, uh, 4015, and in fact has deem and pass language, uh, which was considered on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it was considered as the slaughter uh, rule. I don't know if you, it's still called, Mr. Chairman, the slaughter rule, or it's now the sessions. Doesn't, it's not as alliterative to call it the sessions rule. Um, but that is a tactic that the majority is using uh, here in this bill, which uh, the Democrats did not have the tenacity to see through on that bill and instead sought other means of doing it. Uh, but this is, and this has also been called the, uh, uh, it, was, it was formed as a demon pass. Do you remember that? D-E-M-O-N, demon pass is in this bill. I don't know if that was a deliberate or non-deliberate mischaracterization of, of what it is, but this bill does have the demon pass, uh, what was formerly known as the slaughter rule, now the sessions rule. Uh, slaughter solution is the, what, what's alliterative with session? The session solution, that works, the session solution uh, in this bill. Uh, and again, I think what it shows is the lack of consistency with regard to these procedural arguments uh, surrounding both Democratic and Republican legislation. Uh, and I, I yield back. I, I appreciate the gentleman. I'll yield myself one minute. Uh, Mr. Green. Uh, at what point did you believe you understood what this bill is? Not the amendment or the pay for, but the bill, the SGR bill. At what point do you believe you carefully well understood that? Well, I worked on the SGR for it seems like since we created it in 1997 to try and reform it. And there's been lots of efforts to attach bills. But, but this one that's before us today, sir. Pardon? The one that is before us today. Okay. Now, 4015 was not before the committee. The issue was before the committee was a separate bill number. Well, I think Dr. Burgess carefully said that. Pardon? I think Dr. Burgess said that it was not the same bill number. I'm talking about the language that is here. How long have you known about that language? Oh. Well, it was it, the language that only dealt with the SGR was before our committee. That's all we're talking about. Yeah, it was before our committee. I, I would think it's 4015. But the pay for was not before. Uh, our I'm, I'm, I'm not. But in, the language on the SGR was the, before our committee. Energy and Commerce has no jurisdiction over the pay for. No. I'm asking, trying to clarify, since my name's going to get attached to it, of what my name's being attached to. At what point did but, you become aware of the language? Excuse, excuse, just excuse, okay. excuse this moment. Well, the gentlewoman seeks time. I'll be the, glad to give her time, but I'm trying. The to language clarify. for repeal of the SGR, I that believe, is, is the same today. as what's in 4015, just for the repeal. Uh, that the, all I'm in reference to is the SGR portion. Yeah. How long do you believe you have been aware of this? Yeah. It was introduced in February, and as far as I know, in the committee. Uh, the, we, we, author didn't have any. We could say then since February. Yeah. Would that be correct? I would say well, so. Okay. Then I would ask Dr. Burgess, how long have you been aware of the language exactly as it appears today in the SGR portion? Well, the language that exists today was a result of um, almost like a conference between House and Senate. Sir, sir, I'm trying it's, to. It February. is structurally the same as what we passed out of subcommittee and full committee last July. Yeah. Okay, but February is. Am I making that date up? I'm not trying to lead the witness at all. I'm trying. No, sir, I'm not. I'm trying to get a date. Well, February sixth was the date. February sixth. Thank you very much. All, all I'm trying to make sure is that somebody knew over a month ago of the exact language on a bipartisan basis that you're bringing to the committee, I believe what we're doing that I'm perfectly willing to be responsible for, that we had an, an understanding about what this was, and I thank children. Well, to the, my the, knowledge, I the, would. excuse I, me, just moment, please. Excuse, excuse, me, excuse, me. Excuse, just moment, sure. please. Does the gentleman wish to be yes, given please. time? The gentleman's recognized. To my knowledge, the H.R. 4015 that's considered today was only introduced yesterday. The language? The language on 4015. Mm -hmm. The pay for was introduced uh, yesterday. Sir, sir, I'm not. The, we're talking about the bill that came out of Energy and Commerce. The language. Well, I think February? we stipulate that the language is the same 
from February the 6th. Okay, Mr. Green, and that's I not recognize. The, that's not the contention today. It's the paper. Mr. Green, let me say this. I think everybody in here understands there is a pay for which is not agreed to and the SGR, which is. Is agreed. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. All I'm simply trying to suggest is the language that Dr. Burgess would be responsible for. He, in essence, is not responsible for the pay for. His testimony clearly said we came up with a policy on a bipartisan, bicameral basis. We were attempting to look for help out of the Senate on us, them working together, not me, on a pay for. That did not materialize, so one side's going to offer an opportunity. I am not making anybody responsible for the pay for. Certainly not Dr. Burgess, not you, but the language in the bill is what we're holding hostage here, as opposed to an amendment that would be to that, which would be the pay for. Does gentlewoman wish? I would. Thank you, because I'm not really clear where, where did you go here, because this is Well, not I am. Bill. I well, am. Okay. Let, we, we should not hold hostage the language of the bill. Well, then you shouldn't have put that pay for on it. Well, that's an amendment, Louise. Well, oh, look, here's the thing. We, last night we got at 7.22 p.m., less than 24 hours before the Rules Committee, which is a violation right there before the committee hearing, that that pay for has been attached. Now, if I understand, the bill that fixed the G, uh, SGR was agreed on. Isn't that true? That a lot of work had been done on that, and people passed that bill was considered to be okay. Yes, until it was you passed got, unanimously by Energy and Commerce. Right. So then, uh, then this pay for it comes up last night, and I don't understand what you're saying because this is certainly not the same bill because the pay for attached to it makes it entirely different. Well, what, what? So if 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 you want to remove the pay for, which really wasn't brought here according to the rules of the House anyway. And if we want the Rules Committee can do what it wants, we can take that pay for off and pass the SGR. Why do you say we do that? That's what's, that's what's being holding, holding hostage. Look, I, the hostage part of it is this pay for, which makes absolutely no sense, and it's just the 51st vote to try to kill health care. I mean, and, and it's not going anywhere. Don't you get tired of that sometimes? Is that a question for yeah. me? No, ma'am, I'm not going to get tired of it. You are every, the what, fact that every week say, we pass two or three bills in here, like those today, that we know aren't going anywhere, wouldn't you like to do something better with your I, time? I, you know what, my time is very important the, to me. Yeah. With the lady and what I would well, say, let, let, me see, let me see if we can come to some agreement here. And I'll compromise and be willing to do it your way. But I'd like to say that what Mr. Green is here respectfully trying to do with Dr. Burgess is to bring forward an SGR agreement that they have. But if and you that vote for it, he's got that paper on. on it. Well, the testimony, in fact, supports what their committee has done. And that's what we're in reference to. If, we, if you don't choose to vote for, you know, these amendments that are in order. Let me that, tell you, we've, I, as far as I know, our side is, is solidly behind trying to do something about SGR. And we want to give you and credit for that. And we want to do that. But, I would but, want but you to have I, credit for that. The fact that what you're trying to do is attached to it your 51st bill to kill health care absolutely negates the sensibility of what we're trying to do here. Now, and I hope that every doctor in the United States of America and the AMA and everybody on down knows exactly what you've done. Well, okay. Let, let's suppose that the way I would say it is we're trying to get it to a conference to come you, to you know, a better answer. You know, you started answer. that with me before. Well, no, we're not I, trying I, to, the I, Senate's I, not it, going to take that part. But well, let hold, me hold on, hold on. I, 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 guess, I guess I'm just, I, want, I just want to make it crystal clear here because we're, we're talking in circles. Um, that I hope not. no no not you no you 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 uh, the ranking member made a lot of sense but I'm just saying some of the questions going on here I just want to make it crystal clear here the way this the way this is being set up here today is that this is a self-executing amendment right. so so that members will not have the opportunity to vote on a clean bipartisan product uh, product that came out of energy and commerce right. so the fix is in. Uh, and so, I, I, right. so that, that's where the objection is. So the bipartisan product will never have an opportunity to have a, a vote on its own. And so I think people ought to be clear about that, and that's where our objection is. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Is anybody unclear on that? 
Could Does we the find out? We've had ourselves here before. Does the gentlewoman I will, I will yield back, yes. The gentleman, but, but, and I but thank the only, gentleman. I'll yield back but tell you that once again, that this is one of the strangest meetings of my life. Well, uh, I've, I've been to some strange no meetings. Sense. So, but, uh, but the, it's your game. Uh, well, you know I'll what? I'll yield back the balance of my time. Uh, gentlewoman yields back her time. Let, let me just say this. I think Mr. Green and Dr. Burgess are here trying to support the policy coming out of Energy and Commerce Committee. And they knew about the language, they have known about the language, and the language is not inconsistent with what they thought. The pay for may be a different matter. It is and the, gen well, the, the gentleman is in his right to come and say, I'm for the policy, I'm not for the pay for. Well, and, and he's open about that, and you've been open about that, and we're not trying to attack you. But will you yield to me on that point? I would yield to the gentleman. Right. Then why does not he have Why does he have a self-executing amendment so that when that bill uh, goes to the floor, that without question, that pay for is part of it? You know what? Now, the why don't you give him a separate, or why don't care what you do, so at least give us a chance to vote against doing that. So as I'm trying to give the gentleman credit, and Dr. Burgess credit for working with what was in their purview. And that was really nice of them, but and now they didn't, And they didn't it. try, and, there was no bait and switch. They brought the exact language. The gentleman testified that he- didn't. At 725 last night, you came up with this pay for self-executed in this bill. But that is a Which, pay for as opposed to the policy. But you get- It's part of the policy. Well, I agree, I agree with that. And we're, we're, we're hopeful that we're gonna move that. it. We're hopeful we're gonna move it to the Senate, and then the Senate will say, Bat they agree chance. or disagree. Uh, bad chance. You know better. No. I mean, I, I, I think I think you do all this on purpose because you don't want the Senate to take it up. No, they, they have, can make their own decisions. Pickle, you, you get your press release either, anyway. Well, I'll, I'll tell Although you what, at least we're doing it. At least we're doing this first in the House. Well, gentlewoman, well, seek additional time. I don't see any point in it. Gentlewoman yields there. back her time. The gentleman from uh, uh, Florida, Mr. Webster, is recognized. I don't think I have anything, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> gentleman yields back to some time. I, I do understand Does that gentleman seek this 40, well, yeah, I'll say one Gentleman's thing. recognized. H.R. 4015 doesn't have that amendment in here. It, there, it's, it's a, this is the bill that you said all of you support. There's an amendment, and whether or not it's self-executed or not is based on the rule, not on anything else. Exactly. So, well, that's not allowed. Okay, so... It, well, I, that may be decided here. Excuse, excuse, we haven't decided that, but to, to talk against 4015 in its present form seems unreasonable because it, in its present form, it's exactly what came out of committee. And there's an amendment being offered. There's a bunch of amendments being offered. And whether they're self-executed or not is something we'll decide later. Later, Is that correct, Mr. That would Chairman? be correct, sir. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. I'm gentlelwoman from the gentlewoman does not seek time. I would like to advise this panel that we are almost ready to close the vote, so we need to get down there. Do you seek additional time, Mr. Green? Do you seek additional time, Dr. Burgess? Then this panel is excused, and I thank you for your service. We will come back at the end of the votes, the last vote. We're in uh, recess till then.
Committee will be in order. And thank you very much for coming back after the last vote. And I would like to welcome uh, uh, three guests that we have to testify on H.R. 3189, the Water Rights Protection Act. would welcome the committee chairman, Doc Hastings, would ask that he come and join his former colleagues here on the Rules Committee. Once again, Doc, we're delighted that you're back. I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Napolitano, California, to please come and join us and also the gentleman who uh, has written major parts of this bill, if not all of it, Scott Tipton. Mr. Tipton, welcome to the Rules Committee. I know you were there as well as, oh my gosh. We're going to be in recess for just a minute, please. Then those stenographers. Oh, Well, <laughs> uh, gentlewoman's here. We'll wait for her, and she'll smile at me when she's ready. If you'll. Thank you very much for the short delay, and we will now go ahead and welcome all three of these uh, guests that we have. Obviously, each of you have been waiting here for a long period of time. I don't want to thank all three of you for coming back. And I would, if I can, at this time, announce to each of you that anything you have in writing that you'd like to enter the record without objection, that will be done. And I appreciate your help, as always, your, your ability to effectively communicate uh, your ideas on behalf of your conference and your ideas is respected and appreciated by this committee. The gentleman from Pasco, Washington, the young chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, chairman and the ranking member Slaughter for having this hearing on H.R. 3189. This is a bipartisan bill that's sponsored by our colleague from uh, Colorado, Mr. Tipton, to protect private property rights from the federal government overreach. Water supplies for water users, such as ski areas, ranches, cities and towns, and local conservation, eff conservation efforts, are in danger of being taken away by the federal government, and I think Congress should take uh, whatever action we can to stop it. The Obama administration has recently sought to extort water from individuals, citizens, and businesses <clears throat> through the permitting process. Federal agencies have sought to force businesses and individuals to turn over private property rights as a condition for receiving permits to operate on federal lands. This is very significant, Mr. Chairman. Because this action threatens to undermine over a century of established law that upholds states' right to manage its water and its water law. It also, in my mind, violates con the Constitution's guarantee of just compensation because federal agencies are demanding that water be signed over to the government without any payment. I believe the federal government is unjustly trying to take and control water that doesn't belong to them. And local water users are forced into a lose-lose situation, either turn over as private property rights that are necessary to operate their business uh, or their, their families, or lose the permits and therefore shut down. Water is essential to local economies, particularly in the West. This bill is necessary to protect jobs and local businesses and put an end to these types of heavy-handed tactics by federal bureaucrats. And I said it's important to people in the West Frankly, uh, if you look at this, it's important to everybody because state water law is, uh, has always been recognized as a state's rights. And uh, if the federal government is moving in, it threatens not only the West, where we're probably more, uh, more aware of this, but also, I think, all 50 states. And with that, I thank the, the uh, chairman. I yield back my time. I thank the chairman very much. I'd like to yield now to the gentleman, Ms. Napolitano. Please remember, I, I can't see the mic from here, but the... the Green lights on and pulled in. Good. Gentleman. He, he was nice enough to turn it on for me. Well, he's, he is a nice young He is a gentleman. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, be before you today on this uh, piece of legislation that my colleague has introduced um, to uh, Ranking Member Slaughter, Rules of the Committee. Appreciate uh, very much your listening to uh, what we have to say. Uh, there are currently 121 ski lodges, ski resorts, located in 13 of our states. 
operating on federal forest land, as public land, through long-term special use permits, these resort companies use public taxpayer assets for private profit. In many cases, these companies purchase rights to water in order to operate the resort. The Forest Service is struggling with what happens if the permittee decides to sell their water rights. How could the agency find the new operator if there is no water right to that property available? The Forest Service issued a directive in 2011, unfortunately it created a quite a stir, that as a condition of these special use permits, the applicant must place their water rights in the name of the United States. To be clear, this was not President Obama that is mad about power and wants to own water rights, but rather it was so Forest Service could include those water rights as part of a package when new operators are seeking an existing ski area. The court has invalidated prior directive on procedural grounds, and the Forest Service is currently working on the new directive now at OMB. One they have said will not, I repeat, will not involve permanent applicants transferring their water rights to the federal government. So that should clear it up. There should not be no need for this piece of legislation. This legislation to make, to make clear that, actually, legislation to make clear the ski area permits may not be conditioned on water transfer rights to the government would be appropriate. Better yet, legislation devising a real solution to this problem would be welcome. Uh, H.R. 3189 does neither. It would prevent the entire Department of Agriculture, the entire Department of Interior from conditioning any use of public property on any impairment of any water right. The bill goes well beyond ski resorts, and I repeat, it goes beyond. It, well, um, it, it, it seeks to fundamentally alter all public land management, including management of all units of the National Park Service. If this bill were law, Grazing permits could no longer require that some water be left in the stream. Hydropower projects could no longer be licensed using mandatory bypass flows. Central Valley Project, California, and my state could not include agreements to forego existing water rights in return for taking project water. Any and all uses of public lands which touch on water would be impacted. Without the ability to condition permits or authorizations on reasonable protections, for water-dependent resources such as habitat, timber, or recreation, agencies would not be able to comply with the conservation and multiple-use mandates required by law. Here's the bottom line on H.R. 3189. Federal agencies would have no choice but to deny these permits for grazing, for skiing, etc., in the first place. The bill is so broad, so irresponsible, that if it were enacted, it would mean the end of the very public land activities it is supposed to protect because those activities could no longer be managed responsibly. Congress should get out of the way and allow the Forest Service to come up with a new directive. As they have stated, this is not taking of anyone's property, rather this is placing reasonable conditions on a permit allowing private companies to profit from their use of public assets. Finally, Mr. Chairman, members, it is unfortunate. We are dedicating this time and energy to aspect of water management when our constituents and communities face so many more important water challenges. Most of the West is facing water drought. 53% of the country is facing moderate to exceptional drought. The entire state of California, 100% of it, is in drought. I would urge my colleagues to worry less about ski resorts and more about the drought that is ravaging all of the 17 Western states. The wildfires threatening our lives and property, the floods that, that come from that, and the climate change, which, if we continue to fail to act, will make snow skiing a thing of the past, because it also takes water to make artificial snow. I do have, uh, and thank you for uh, allowing it to go on the record, the letters, uh, there are 90 conservation, recreation, sportsmen grouping against this uh, uh, bill. Um, and we also have uh, the letter from the administration, which is in your um, power, I believe, I bet you've gotten it, opposing this bill. Uh, the registration only fixes in interior, the, any amendment that is proposed from what we're looking at, uh, proposed to fill only uh, reclamation, ESA, FERC, and the reserve water rights. Not included is our, uh, agriculture and many of the other agencies that would be in, uh, um, um, have unintended consequences as a result of this bill. So with that, Mr. Chair, I open to uh, questions as soon as my colleague gives his um, side of it. Thank you very much for your testimony. We now would uh, turn to the gentleman, the uh, author of the bill, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Slaughter, I'd certainly 
want to appreciate you for taking up this vital bill uh, that's important to the West. Water supplies uh, for farmers, ranchers, recreation opportunities, municipalities, and other water users is vital to the West. H.R. 3189 passed out of the Natural Resources Committee with bipartisan support. And I request a structured rule under which the merits of this common sense legislation can be openly discussed. Water is indeed the lifeblood of the West. And entire rural and urban communities rely on water rights granted to them by states in order to sustain the way of life. Unfortunately, these valuable property rights have come under attack by federal agencies that seek to extort water through the use of permits, approvals, and other one-sided federal tools, which leave no choice for the water users at their mercy. These actions threaten hundreds of thousands of jobs, millions in revenue, local water management and conservation authority, and upend over a century of federal deference to state water law. H.R. 3189 simply retains the structure of water law that we have today. When we look at what farmers, ranchers, ski areas, small businesses, towns, and cities have relied on, we need to make sure that we have a policy that is going to be able to grant certainty to them. This bill grants no new rights to anyone, nor does it take any away. It simply prohibits federal land management agencies from taking, through permits, property rights for which they would otherwise need to pay just compensation under the United States Constitution. I'm proud to have been able to have worked on this common sense bipartisan effort with my colleagues in the House Natural Resources Committee and others across the West. As my colleague noted, we have 121 different ski areas that need to be able to have certainty. But are our farmers, are our ranchers, are our municipalities any less important? To be able to provide certainty for them, we received testimony in committee from Chief Tidwell that not once, not once, has water been sold by a ski area for profit. They need it to be able to operate. This is custom and policy in the West. The simple knowledge of this bill is we codify those practices in the West to be able to provide for that certainty. And while others may try to portray this as infringing upon other rights, the bill does not speak to those. The practices which are currently in place will not be altered. We do not expand nor delete any authorities that currently exist. A common sense piece of legislation which for the West will provide much needed certainty for all of our different communities. Once again, I'd like to thank the members of this committee for your consideration. We look forward to advancing this legislation that we can protect the vital water supplies and the local communities that rely on it. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tipton, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tipton, uh, I have a question, and that is that um, these ski areas and other areas that you speak about and the water that they have and their use of that, it seems like that there are just natural uh, advantages for these western areas that the entire community needs these ski areas and needs them to be strong for economic viability. And is the concern that they could lose the way they do business today, or is the concern that the water as it would flow downhill, so to speak, into other communities and areas that they also could lose control of that? You know, it is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for that question. Here's the real challenge that the ski areas, uh, Ski Country USA uh, supports this legislation. Why? Because we saw the federal government come in with a taking. Uh, some of us in the West, we call it theft. To require, if you wanted to be able to get that permit renewed, you had to sign over your water rights to the federal government. I will remind everyone, this is a balance sheet item. Dollars have actually been invested. So they have a deep concern, and part of the problem that we truly see is, once this legislation was first introduced, uh, we saw the National Forest Service back off their rule. As my colleague noted, they are currently rewriting a rule. Not one of us in this room know what that rule is going to pretend. That is the very uncertainty that we are trying to be able to eliminate. If you're going to be able to make those investments, those capital dollars to be able to be invested and be able to operate these businesses, you need to be able to have that certainty. This is common practice in the West. As you well know, we've got to be able to protect this private property right. That's what this legislation does. Well, I. 
definitely see that. Uh, Chairman Hastings? I, I just want to put an emphasis on what Mr. Tipton said. Uh, water law has been and is a, falls under the province of the states. And for the federal government to can say, okay, a condition of using state water laws, you have to give it to the federal government, is exactly opposite of, of what, uh, what we should even be thinking about. And so that's, that's what, uh, what Mr. Tipton's bill uh, focuses on, is that uh, it, it simply uh, re-says that Western or, or water law is the state's province. I think that's a very, very important principle. I think it's a huge principle, and I'm quite honestly concerned about people who would take advantage of these areas, and so I'm delighted that you're here. And I, whether it's somebody claims it's an unintended consequence or not, I think it is a huge consequence and something should be stopped on July that year. Mr. Bishop? Uh, thank you for being here. I want to thank Mr. McGovern because he has finally won. Um, repeatedly he has said that we ought to deal with significant issues that impact. This is a significant issue, probably one of the most significant ones for the West. And if other parts of the nation don't recognize it, it doesn't lessen the significance of this issue. This bill is one that has to be discussed. It's talking about the entire future, especially for us in the West. So thank you. This is one of those bills that is that important. So Mr. Um, Mr. Tipton, as you were dealing with this bill, did you spend any time working with minorities or outside groups that in some ways tries to narrow this bill from its origin, origins? You know, we uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Bishop, and appreciate that question. We did. We sat down with conservation groups. We sat down with farmers. We sat down with ranchers. We sat down with municipalities, ski areas, to be able to make sure that we were tail tailoring a bill which was going to best serve the interests, literally, of the West. I think that the end product, which we ultimately have, has narrowed the scope of this bill to make sure that we are not inflicting any change in terms of existing authorities, but we will protect that private property right, the state water law that Chairman Hastings is speaking to in the priority systems of the West. And also to make sure that with that Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, uh, when we were talking about unjust takings without compensation, that that will be protected as well, because there have been real dollars that have been invested uh, by these different communities for their water. That, and you've, you've, you've signed a difference there between regulatory takings and actual takings that uh, is problematic for many of us who have federal lands that dot our, our states. And I appreciate you making that distinction, but we're still talking about private water rights that are dealing with here. Uh, Mr. Tipton said that uh, he hasn't seen what the Forest Service has done in a revised position. Chairman Hastings, do you know of what they actually will come up with, or are we still in the dark of what they may or may not do? Well, we're still in the dark, and, and uh, I, I guess my biggest concern is why are they pursuing something like this? I mean, it's well established. I'm not, a, I'm not a, an attorney, but I think it's well established in, in water law that that's the state's province uh, to have, uh, uh, you know, to, that states do have the primary responsibility on water law. So I'm wondering why, uh, what they're even writing, to be very honest with you. Okay. So, so let me ask you know, some specific issues. Does this bill in any way modify the bypass flow? Mr. Mr. Tipton, anybody? No, it does not. What about FERC requirements? It does not uh, infringe on FERC at all. You, you have an amendment, a manager's amendment, I suppose, that's assumed that talks about issues and grants. What do you mean by putting those lang that language in there? Right. What we're doing with our manager's amendment, let me pull that out is we are simply clarifying uh, that we are not going to infringe on any existing authorities. Uh, if it's currently legal for you to be able to do it, you may. If it's not, you may not. And that's what this bill is about. Does this bill in any way bring up the issue that we faced that was very contentious a while ago that deals with the smelt? No. This has nothing to do with that one? No. This is about the water for the rest of us? Okay. Mr. Hastings, maybe I can address this one to you. Why is it important that this apply to both Department of Interior and Department of Ag? Well, I because their of their jurisdiction uh, essentially on private, private on on public lands, federal lands, 
and their permitting of those that would use those lands. Keep in mind, there's, it's kind of a dichotomy, if you will. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a rancher, for example, and you have uh, a permit to graze uh, on agricultural lands, BLM lands, and other lands, uh, you should have some certainty exactly what the water rights are as your cattle crosses because, uh, you know I, know, I know cattle are smart, but I'm not sure if they know the difference between agricultural lands, and forest lands, and BLM lands. I'm sure if you showed them a map, they would respond. Well, yeah, yeah we could do that, I guess. But, but, that, but that's the reason why. So what you're talking about, I mean, in the original <laughs> presentation, we were talking about ski resorts and their right. issues. That's a specific issue there. Right. But what you're saying what? is we have the same problem for ranchers, for cattlemen, for farmers. As I'm assuming that's why the Farm Bureau is so intensely behind this. And the same problem is not just dealing with regulations coming from the Forest Service, but BLM is doing the same thing. And for our friends that aren't in the West, those are distinct agencies that have a different responsibility. Right. What they are doing, what we have seen evidence of, is they are trying to use the permit process to acquire title to water. Water uh, has historically uh, been, the, as I said before, the province of state water law. And by, by, by using the permit process, you're going around that. That's, that's a, it's, it's a very, like you said, this is very, very significant from that standpoint. Would you say that one more time? They're trying to go around state water law, uh, usurp state power. Uh, control, there's a lot of words you, you could uh, use. To if corral, you have, if you have, to if, corral if, water rights. Yeah, if you have better adjectives. Uh, no, I don't have, yeah. You just said it very well, yeah. which is why I get frustrated. I'm, I'm looking at the administration's statement of policy, and it says this bill would, uh, would exclude them from exerting some control over the exercise of water rights located on federal lands. They ain't talking about some control. They are trying to talk about putting as a condition for you using the land, you have to give up private property rights. Not some control, but that, seed they, all they were, rights. They, 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 there has been evidence they're trying to seed title of water. And then they claim that if this bill were to pass, that it would make it difficult to protect ongoing public lands, maximum beneficial use for federal water facilities, ensure adequate water for fisheries and threatened or endangered species. Nowhere in here does it ever talk about what, what, is tempt, what could possibly happen to cattlemen and ranchers as well as ski resorts. So this is a bigger issue than just a few ski resorts. Well, they, they, I, no, I haven't, I haven't read that, but I doubt if they say you that there's a... I, I didn't think I would. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I doubt if they say there's a concern there about private property rights, uh, private pro you know, uh, and, and water is a private property right in states. It's been recognized by states. If it doesn't say that in there, then uh, this is really, whatever they're saying is missing the whole point of this legislation. And, and that's one of the things I'd like to emphasize uh, coming from a public land state that have a lot of ski resorts in my district, but I also have a lot of cattle and grazing that is done both on, on Forest Service land and on BLM land, and all of those are being threatened with coercive tactics. Um, and I'm not going to blame this simply on the Obama administration. Most of the people who are coming up with this idea is, are long-term federal employees that just wanted to control the water. Not necessarily, a, it's not, this is not a partisan thing that came from somebody out of Chicago. This comes from people within the system who have, who have long been there. Um, can I ask whoever would like to deal with this? There's two amendments that deal with Indian rights. Uh, a Kilmer Amendment and a Mullen Amendment. If I could ask some kind of comparison between the two. Let me try that first. Uh, the, the, the one by, by Mr. Mullen simply says, essentially, that uh, uh, Indian country should be treated exactly as states as it relates to water rights. Uh, what the other amendment does simply exempts them from uh, this legislation, which I, I, I find a little bit uh, uh, interesting because by saying you're exempt from this legislation, you're acknowledging that there is a, an attempt to try to take water rights away. I, I, I personally believe that the uh, Mullen Amendment is much, much, uh, much, much stronger because it, it says that water rights should be the province of Indian country and tribal lands, which okay. is what states have. Oh, good. That was my assumption. So you have no problem with the Mullen Amendment? No, I think that the uh, Mullen Amendment actually stands up in a stronger fashion for our tribes, uh, the Mullen Coal Amendment. Uh, the tribes cannot be forced under the Mullen Amendment 
to acquire water rights on behalf of the federal government. Uh, that codifies that, uh, I believe, a stronger uh, amendment to actually be able to speak to the issue. Go ahead. Uh, if I may, uh, I believe you also have a copy of the summary of the amendment submitted. Uh, if it's so good a bill, why is the Allegheny uh, National Forest, Delaware River Watershed, Delaware Water Gap, Chesapeake Bay, Delaware River, Long Island Sound, Puget Sound, Olympic National Park, and uh, others uh, wanting to be exempt from this bill? I would certainly not want to at any time imply that there were any kind of political motivations for anything someone would write. I, I just do it on the fact that they don't have the fund of dealing with the federal government the way we do. If, if the gentlelady would yield, I, I would just say, by the very nature of writing these exemption legislations, you are tacitly acknowledging that the federal government is through the permit process trying to take control of, uh, of state water rights. Just by simply saying, oh, it's out there, but and it's okay for them to take somebody else, but don't take mine. So they are tacitly, tacitly saying that this is what is happening going on, but don't do it to me. That's the way I interpret those that uh, uh, have uh, offered those amendments. Right, but if you look at the, uh, your Tipton Amendment, it doesn't fix it. It's, if it's an amendment to fix the bill, then that's the same, uh, I would say the same thing about that. Can I reclaim my time? <laughs> yeah, let me, let me come back here with one last uh, question maybe to Mr. Tipton. There has been talk in some of these issues about uh, prohibiting the Forest Service from taking title to water rights uh, for, for some ski areas. How is that language of title to water rights different than your underlying bill? Uh, it's one thing to be able to have title. Uh, Congressman Bishop, you may have title to a car that is sitting in Utah, but that doesn't mean that you can use it. You not only need title, but possession of the product, in this case, water to be able to actually grow crops, to actually to be able to water cattle, to actually to be able to make snow. So having title is not in uh, concert with actually having use. This bill actually clarifies it. And if I may speak to my counterpart's uh, point in regards to some of the amendments, happy to be able to talk about them, but shouldn't every one of those entities have the same Fifth Amendment protections that are guaranteed under the Constitution as every other owner of water in the country? I think they should. You know, there was, um, there was a time when the Depression first hit, and this was actually done by a Republican administration, this is before FDR, where the federal government went to the western states and they gave them a deal, said we will give you all the federal lands back if we can keep all the surface rights. And every governor, the overwhelming majority of whom were Democrats at the time, basically said, screw you, I'm not going to do that. We either get the surface rights, in this case the water rights, or the surface land is of no value to us. Right. Those of us that still have the fun of dealing with the Interior Department and the Forest Service recognize that if you don't have those rights that go along with it, there is no value to it. And, though, and so even though, uh, on behalf of my ski resorts, they asked me to be supportive of this process, I'm happy to, this is also of significant importance to the Cattlemen Association, the Farm Bureau, because this is talking about their livelihood as well, and making sure that these types of private property rights cannot be confiscated, and you can't use the heavy hand of the government to say, if you want to, to graze again, give me something that you owe first. That's, that's extortion. That's not the right way of doing it. So I'm proud the Forest Service has backed off slightly, but I would be happier if I actually see what they are planning in lieu of this, because once again, in talking to a lot of the people who are career employees in the Forest Service, there is a mindset that is, that is problematic and troubling. So I appreciate you bring this bill. I appreciate this is not going to have, obviously, the commentary that the other one did, although I know Mr. Nugent has lots of questions that he's willing to ask. And you ain't leaving until I'm done. But at the same time, for those of us in the West, this is, I mean, this is life and death. This is bread and butter. This is any other cliche you want me to come up with. That's how important this one is. Yield back. Chairman yields back his time. Gentleman, recognize. Mr. Chairman, let me just ask unanimous consent to put the statement of administration policy for both of these bills in the record. 
And Mr. McGovern and I will yield to our Westerner over here to, uh, I, to our time. Thank the gentlelady for the time. Uh, this is a, you know, those of you who are not uh, from the West or might be sitting around saying, what are you all, what are you all fighting about? What are you all talking about? Um, the genesis of this particular issue is the U.S. Forest Service overstepping its authority. I think Mr. Bishop and I agree. I think Mr. Tipton and I agree. Mr. Hastings and I agree. Mr. Paltano and I agree with the 2011 air, uh, Ski Area's Water Directive. That's the genesis of this. That uh, Forest Service policy required uh, a forced transfer of ownership of water rights from ski area permittees to the federal government. And uh, those are valuable uh, assets that need to be protected for ski areas. So I uh, wanted to work with Mr. Tipton, uh, I think, to come up with a bill that I think would have been a fine suspension bill uh, to, uh, to address uh, that issue uh, for what is the economic lifeblood of our communities, uh, which are the, uh, the ski resorts. However, through the process, this bill has been convoluted into something that even my ski areas don't support anymore. Uh, and I know that Mr. Tipton's counties, La Plata County and Pitkin County, oppose this bill. I don't know if any of Mr. Pitkin's, uh, Mr. Tipton's counties even support this bill anymore. My ski counties oppose this bill, Eagle, Summit, and Grant. And, and Mr. Bishop, political motivation, Grant County has three Republican commissioners, zero Democratic commissioners, just so you know. And they oppose this bill. And they say as the home of two downhill ski areas, Winter Park and Granby, the county also values the key role the ski industry plays for the economy. It's a key, it's a key driver in, in Grand County. But it says, the concern Grand County has with the bill as drafted is that it's far broader than need be and creates a potential for dire unintended consequences for streams in the county and other headwater areas. I'd like to submit this letter to the record. With, without, without objection. So, I mean, even the folks that it's supposedly designed to help don't even want it anymore. I have a letter from the uh, National Ski Areas Association. I'd like to submit that to the record as well, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. A quote in part, make it abundantly clear that ski areas have a narrow and pointed agenda with respect to this legislation and that we're committed to maintaining stream and aquatic species health. We are advocating changes to the bill to narrow its scope even further. Uh, I have offered uh, an amendment that would do that. I know Ms. Uh, the ranking member, Ms. Napolitano, supports that amendment. I offered it along with Ms. Del Benny of Washington State. Uh, it would conform this legislation to something that the areas that it deigns to help actually support. And it would, and because frankly, when we look at our economy in Eagle Summit and, and uh, Pitkin County and uh, ski areas, we also have robust tourism around fishing and whitewater rafting, which this bill uh, would devastate, uh, and which is why those counties are so up at arms, which is why many of the resorts now uh, oppose this bill. This bill is a job destroyer for my district and Mr. Tipton's district, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if this bill were to become law, we would lose uh, recreational opportunities and jobs related to them uh, in the counties that, that we represent. So there is an easy fix. That's the good news. Uh, we've offered an amendment. We, we Again, we worked with Mr. Tipton through this process. We were hoping that this could be fixed at the committee level. Uh, it was actually made worse in committee level. They added the term impairment of title, uh, which expanded the scope of the bill. They added a savings clause, which actually made the bill uh, unclear and actually seemed to negate part of the bill. And they added a definition of water rights uh, that are determined by state law. They did, and now we're coming here with the manager's amendment, which also we were hoping would include the language that would allow this to be a non-controversial bill. But when we first saw it, uh, we found out that, again, this language didn't make any of the improvements that would actually cause this, these ski counties that are supposed to need this bill to actually support the bill. So um, there's a problem I think we, we, uh, we agree on and we want to do something about, the 2011 Ski Areas Water Directive. Maybe uh, somebody will take this bill as a signal that we're not happy with it, but it got so convoluted here that we're no longer even solving the problem in a way that the resort areas in my community support. So I, I was hoping that through this legislative process we could improve this bill, either a suspension bill, manager's amendment, uh, and I wanted to go to Ms. Napolitano briefly uh, to talk about how our amendment, if included, allowed to go to the floor and voted on, would limit the scope in a bill in a way that would actually help the areas that it purports to assist. Thank you, Mr. Polis. And uh, looking at the bill itself, it limits it to the Forest Service and the ski area. 
essentially. That's all it is. And would you agree that's the issue that we're supposed to be addressing well, in this I bill? I believe that was the intent to begin with. And it has been uh, apparently, as you say, convoluted to other areas. But uh, it would require any ski area permitted to apply or acquire a water right in the name of the United States under the law as a condition. Uh, issuance renewal, right. Th this, this would, uh, acting through the Secretary of Agriculture and the Chief of the Forest Service. And, and I'd like to go to Mr. Tipton. I've been informed that La Plata and Pitkin County, two of your biggest ski counties in your district, oppose this bill. Are there any counties in your district that support this bill in its present form? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I thank you for that question. And uh, I'll quote a statement that was made earlier. Heaven forbid that politics would actually come into some of those decisions. Sat down with the county commissioners. Uh, what did Aspen Ski Company say? That's not my district. That's in your district. That's right. Uh, so you uh, just spoke to Pitkin County. That's where the, Aspen Ski the County. The count, yes, I was asked in your district, are there any counties right. that support this bill? I've been uh, informed yeah, that are. Pitkin County and La Plata County you, oppose uh, Mont Rose County, Mesa County, Montezuma County, Garfield County, Canales County, Rio Blanco County, Gunnison County. They support Rio the current County. language. So that's they fair. You, no, look, that's fair. I'm not trying to set you up. You have counties on both sides of this bill. That's, that's fair. I, I understand that. Uh, all of the ski counties in my district oppose this bill. Uh, so I, I, again, some of the ski, some of the, your two uh, biggest dollar-wise ski counties, I think, are Pitkin and La Plata. I don't know if Routes up there um, or Garfield, they might be up there too, uh, or if they have positions. But at least your two of your most significant ski counties, with world-renowned ski resorts. No, like I Aspen, think uh, I, can, I, I don't believe I can accept that. Okay. Uh, simply because if you're talking about county commissioners as opposed to the entities that are creating the jobs. <laughs> Uh, I don't believe that that's going to be an accurate Well, I, I am talking about county commissioners. Okay, uh, you are talking. Uh, and, and they represent. talking earlier about actually the ski, skiing people and the people that are creating the jobs. Well, I also submitted to the uh, record a letter from the National Ski Areas Association that uh, requested advocating changes to the bill to narrow its scope. Um, I, I have with, no and I, I talked to Vail, uh, Vail Resorts uh, a couple days ago, uh, you know, about this. Uh, they too want to see this. They wanted to see this narrow fix. Uh, they love us applying pressure, obviously, on the administration. Um, but when you look at a county like Grand County, which has Winter Park in it, all three commissioners are Republican. Uh, they oppose this bill. The ski resorts themselves also benefit from whitewater rafting, from fishing, from all of the ancillary activities that are countercyclical and provide business and jobs off season. And they have indicated to me uh, that this bill, in its current form, without narrowing the scope, actually hurts jobs in those areas. And that's, of course, the job of the county commissioners. They look across the entire uh, area. So again, I understand that you have some counties in favor, some opposed. Uh, all of my counties are opposed. The ski counties, I mean, and this bill purports to help ski counties. So my ski counties don't want this bill that we're trying to foist on them. They want a solution to the forced transfer of ownership of water rights that they felt was imposed on them with the 2011 area, uh, uh, Ski Areas Water Directive. That's what, they, that's what they want. We hoped we would have the opportunity to, to work with you on that because I know it was important to your district as well. This could have been a bill that all your counties supported. This could have been a bill that all my counties supported. This could have been a bill that the National Ski Areas Association was, uh, was uh, unambiguous in their support of. Uh, this could have been a bill that passed with uh, a suspension margin or more that the ranking member could have worked with you on because it, 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 it addressed a real need. But instead, uh, we have put language in this bill uh, that uh, relates to uh, a completely unrelated issue, which I understand is a, co a cause of Mr. Bishop. I mean, I know this is something that he cares about. Perhaps uh, you do as well. But it's one that works to the detriment of the areas I represent. So we don't want to package something that purports to help the ski resorts I represent uh, because of their outrage with the 2011 Ski Areas Water Directive and package it as something that helps them when it's actually something that destroys jobs uh, in the very uh, district uh, that is affected by uh, the water directive. So uh, again, I would, I would just go to Mr. Tipton. Why aren't we able to at least agree on what we agree on maybe do a suspension bill along the lines we indicated. If you want to proceed with a partisan bill that does other things, I mean, you know, we can have a partisan vote, but I still have interest in doing a, a, a ski resort bill because I think it's necessary and important and it would be a good thing to do. 
But to do it when my own counties that have ski resorts oppose it, and many of yours do, and some don't, just doesn't make sense. So can we continue to work together on this issue, uh, which I feel is not resolved in any way, shape, or form by what's become a partisan bill? Okay. And um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to respond on this. First, when we're talking about your counties and my counties, uh, they're also represented by something called the Cattle, Colorado Cattlemen's Association. They're also represented by people called the Farm Bureau who are endorsing this legislation, saying it will create and be able to preserve jobs. I'd be very interested to be able to see some of the documentation that it's going to actually hurt jobs rather than an assumption, because I have heard erroneous assumptions that it's going to impact some bypass flows. It's not going to allow uh, rivers to be able to have inflow to be able to maintain endangered species. It doesn't impact it at all. Doesn't change that at all. So I guess I would like to maybe return to the very beginning uh, when you'd signed on as a co-sponsor of the original legislation, and I'm not purporting to be able to change it because I think we've improved the bill. Manager's amendment will actually strengthen it even anymore. Uh, were you supportive of the original piece of legislation that you and I co-introduced? We uh, were absolutely willing to work to make it better in committee. No, I, no, that's that not the point, though. Were you supportive of the original legislation that we introduced? Absent the language that was added in committee uh, and the... It never spoke specifically to ski areas in the original incorporating legislation. It always spoke, always spoke to private property rights when it comes to being able to protect water in the West. And we should not be, in my estimation, and... And, and certainly free. I understand we've all got to be able to represent our districts, our specific interests, but I am not willing to sacrifice the private property rights of farmers and ranchers to the exclusion or for the benefit of any other one specific entity. What I, and well, I read those letters coming out of the ski areas yeah. is they'd love to be able to have this tailored specifically. The bill does that. We are protecting that water for the ski areas. Let's also protect We're claiming my time. Let me just, let me just do a quick pointed question on this, uh, Mr. Tipton. So, again, do you agree that the genesis of this particular legislative effort arose from the 2011 Ski Areas Water Directive? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. that, that was one of the beginning So points. isn't there a risk that we are, in fact, watering down, pardon the pun, Mr. Chairman, uh, our legislative outrage mm -hmm. over that particular directive by including everything in the sun under here so that message is actually lost in this bill. I'll be happy to go to you. Uh, if you could narrow it and close the door, you may have a point. But we can't and we won't. Simply because going through my district, sitting down, visiting with uh, cattlemen and ranchers, talking to communities, this has been an issue that has been raised. We now have testimony that came through those committee hearings that we're talking about something that uh, I think as Americans we all ought to certainly share. Do we want to stand up for that agricultural community that feeds us? We got testimony that the federal government coming through uh, the BLM, through the Forest Service, through the Department of Ag, the Department of Interior, we're going to coerce water rights away if we wanted to be able to see permits renewed. So I think part of our job, part of our job is not just to look out the rearview mirror, but to look out the windshield of impacts. We're seeing the tentacles of government starting to expand to reach into these other areas. And, and I, I hope you'll join me. Glad to be able to work with you. If you'll stand with me with the farm and ranch community and the other communities in Colorado as well. We, we all uh, have diverse districts, and, and, and our districts have different economic interests, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tipton is aware that uh, Summit County I don't know if there's uh, any cows in Summit County. Eagle County has some, but now they're mostly in Mr. Tipton's part of the district. There could very well be a few in my part of the district. Uh, but in terms of being an economic driver of that area that I represent, the driver's a tourism industry. And from a core, you know, corollary industries, construction, hospitality, uh, that's what drives the economy. I, it's, it's certainly possible there's uh, one or two uh, cattlemen in my part of the district. I mean, it's, it's not a lot, um, but that is not the driver of jobs. I do have a uh, letter from the Eagle River Water and Sanitation District, Upper Eagle Regional Water Authority. I'd like to submit to the record, Mr. Chair. Objection. A water district that encompasses Mr. Tipton's and my district, uh, which does point out that uh, the Forest Service is not of the legal authority to impose bypass flows, and a federal water rights task force is so determined, and uh, any amendment that they would do so would be a major expansion of federal authority over state-granted water rights. And I, I, having submitted that to the record, 
Uh, these are the folks responsible for uh, providing water in the area, and they are informing me, uh, and it is addressed to Mr. Mr. Tipton as well, as long as both as long as as well as both of our senators, that it is does in fact. Uh, affect the uh, the bypass flows. I'd like to go to Mr. Napolitano to respond on that as well. In your opinion, does this bill, it's been noted by Mr. Tipton, this bill does not impact bypass flows. That's not an exact quote, but he said something along those lines. Do you uh, disagree with that? Uh, yes, we, we would feel, because there are many groups that have come to us or have submitted information that it does impact water flows. Uh, in the conservation, the river clubs, the Sierra clubs, the Tennessee Clean Water Network, uh, Utah Rivers Council, Watch of Oregon, uh, all of those inf are, are sending similar letters to the fact that it does uh, impact them. And, and of course, there is no directive in the, uh, uh, there's no um, directive like the 2011 ski directives that impacts the farmers and farms. There's nothing in that directive that uh, that talks to that. So we're, we're certainly just the ski areas are the prime, I would say, target, if you will, of this bill to help them deal with a Forest Service uh, error in submitting that uh, initial directive, which now they're trying to correct. Am I correct? Yes. So that uh, uh, we've tried to get a um, uh, copy of it, but of course they can't release it because it has to go to public comment and then after the public comment. So while we argue that we haven't seen anything, we can't because it's in, in the OMB. And let me, let, me, uh, let me address the manager's amendment with you, Mr. Napolitano. The, the manager's amendment, uh, was a, a believe, a grant, a earnest attempt to deal with our concerns over bypass flows. It specifically, uh, you ha includes language that deals with the Endangered Species Act and the bypass flow issues relating to it. The, the, let me, let's be clear: the critique of this bill is not, oh, this bill is bad for the environment. That may be part of the mix, and by removing endangered species, that may be part of it. The, the critique is, is bad for the economy and destroys jobs. So my question for you, Mr. Politano, isn't the bypass flow issue also affected by agencies that have relevant authority like the Forest Service, the BLM, Department of Agriculture, uh, and all of those agencies are as much if not more a part of the concern on bypass flows as the Endangered Species Act? They certainly would be, yes. And uh, apparently, going back to the impact on some of the uh, counties, Grand Summit and Eagle have issued... Uh, uh, letters uh, to opposing because of that specific fact. And I'll just, since I haven't gone to Mr. Hastings yet, I, I wanted to see if I've convinced him to support my amendment. Well, uh, let me, uh, if I may, respond broadly, and thank you for, uh, for asking me the question. It, it appears here from, and, uh, and I, I give Mr. Tipton a great deal of credit, and, and you for trying to uh, protect your particular industry in, in your area. But the, the, the tacit acknowledge that both of you have said is that through the permitting process, the federal government is trying to acquire state water rights. Now, I think that's wrong. I just think that's wrong, and you acknowledge that by saying you're trying to protect uh, a ski resource. So if that's wrong, why is it right then to get water rights from other entities that are not, a subject, to, not subject to this particular legislation? And Mr. Tipton's bill speaks to everybody else that has that. Now, I will say this, uh, Mr. Chairman, if this is going to be the debate on this area where we protect certain industries at the expense of others, I will take that debate any time. If that's going to be a difference between the philosophy of the two political parties, I will love to take that debate down to the, the floor any time. And it appears to me... It appears to me that this is one of those cases that fall in that category, and I welcome that debate. Well, uh, again, again, the genesis of this issue was the 2011 Ski Areas Water Directive. Um, this is now an attempt to include unrelated uh, valid concerns. Would, would, would the gentleman yield? On I'll be that happy point. to yield. I mean, I'm saying this, this, about, this goes to the heart of the issue that I spoke to earlier, and that Mr. Spitz, uh, Tipton spoke to, and that is the issue that the states have primary responsibility for water law. And when you have directives that as a condition of a, of a permit, you change and, get, and you retain or get state water rights, that goes contrary to Western water law. And, and that is wrong in itself. And, and so that's the, that's the whole premise of, of the start here. Re reclaiming my time, and law in Colorado is clear that bypass flows are legal. 
uh, it's unequivocal with regard to that. Uh, I, this is one of those instances where, there, where we can either agree on what we agree on and try to make it law, or we can have yet another one of these uh, empty partisan debates, which well, on the floor there'll be a vote. I don't know if there'll be seven Democrats or two Democrats that vote for it. It won't be a lot. There might be a few Republicans that oppose it because of the different economic interests in their district. But it's not going to be something that is going to become law. Or we can find a way to work together on what I think all of us agree on, which is outrage over the 2011 Ski Area's Water Directive, trying to find a legislative rev remedy to that that is narrowly tailored uh, in a way that it meets the economic needs of Mr. Tipton's district and, Mr. M and my district, uh, helps grow jobs rather than destroy jobs in Colorado. Uh, and, of course, uh, other members will have that own math they're doing in their district and saying, does this create jobs or destroy jobs? Uh, but I, I had hoped, of course, that we uh, could do that. I still hope, Mr. Chair, that my amendments made in order. I, uh, at least Mr. Hastings didn't say outright he'd oppose my amendment. He, he talked... Well, if the gentleman you know, around I, it, he didn't I, support I have, it. I have been on record many times yeah. saying, having served on this committee, the wisdom of this, of this committee is paramount as to which amendments they make in order. Uh, so if uh, that amendment is made in order, then we will, uh, you know, debate the amendment. But uh, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, the wisdom of this committee. Well, there's times I didn't, but there was times that <laughs> this year, this year I do more than, be, than I have in the past. Let's put it that way. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, sometimes bills get better in the legislative process. Sometimes they get worse. Uh, sadly, I would point to this bill as an example of a bill that I truly had hoped. I truly had hoped we could have got it to a place where most members of this body could have supported. I know the ranking member would have been happy and had, did participate in that. Uh, but we, uh, sadly, uh, we're not able to get to a point uh, where the bill is beneficial to my district or, it, uh, in my understanding, beneficial to my state or the country. So I do hope we can fix it. This is the last chance, the floor, uh, our committee, uh, in, in controlling that amendment process. I do hope that we can fix it. And if we do that, it will send a very strong message uh, around the overstepping of authority around the 2011 Ski Area's Water Directive. If we don't do that, It'll just be another bill, like the 51st repeal of Obamacare. It'll be a bill. It'll pass. Uh, it'll be a bill. There it goes. The Senate won't look at it. Nothing comes of it. And frankly, I think the message that we were trying to send is even diluted uh, around the outrage over that uh, water directive. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Chairman Coles, recognized. Thank you very much. Um, I have a very specific area I wanted to pursue, and my friend Mr. Bishop touched on this a little bit, and you did in your earlier testimony. Um, but, of course, the oldest sovereign entities in the West aren't the United States government, aren't the states, it's the Indian tribes. And uh, they're governmental units with inherent negotiated rights. Uh, and I know you, Mr. Tippin, to be one of the strongest defenders uh, and advocates uh, for Native Americans in the House of Representatives. You've been that since the day you showed up, been very supportive of tribal governments and tribal interest rights every step along the way, and a member of the Native American Caucus. So your credentials here are without, uh, without doubt, in my view. Now, I do notice, uh, so, so I want to ask you two questions. One, I want to ask you specifically, again, to tell us how the legislation affects existing Indian water rights and how litigation would proceed. We all know there's always controversy about these things. Second, I'd like you to address the, uh, in the administration's policy statement, and one of the, and this is a partial line, I won't read the whole sentence, was the bill threatens the federal government's longstanding authority to manage property and claim proprietary rights for the benefit of Indian tribes, dot, 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 and list other entities as well. So, I'm, you know, that's a pretty sweeping charge. And, by the way, the federal government hasn't done a very good job of doing this over the years. So preserving the federal government's right to do something to Indian tribes is something that Indians shudder about uh, quite frequently. But I, I want to give you a chance to respond to that specific uh, critique of the bill and then also to educate us a little bit more about what the bill does with respect to Indian water rights. Uh, I'll start. Uh, thank you, Chairman Cole. I appreciate uh, your leadership on this issue, and I know how passionate you are in terms of uh, standing up for Native American tribes and, and uh, the rights uh, that uh, they're duly owed by treaty uh, obligations that have been signed by this country. And 
the word that I certainly hear out of my district. I have two tribes in my district, but up against the Navajo Reservation, Hopi, uh, down into uh, all of the Pueblos down into New Mexico is there's a great shudder uh, among our Native American tribes often when they hear that the federal government's going to be there to help them. Uh, the water rights obligation, uh, the federal government currently has a very poor record of truly following through on. Uh, they've been long delayed, uh, little developed, and uh, our tribes need to be able to develop those water rights uh, to be able to grow their communities and to be able to help the surrounding areas certainly as well. So I think that that is a poor and an accurate assertion in terms of what this legislation is going to do, uh, particularly uh, with the amendment that uh, you and Mark Wayne Mullen uh, have put forward. Uh, we are going to make sure that we are strengthening uh, the tribal position, uh, that they are not going to be beholden to the whims of the federal government, uh, not be put into the position of being used as a tool to be able to require, acquire water rights on behalf of the federal government. So I think uh, at those various levels, this is a positive step forward to be able to make sure that uh, we are codifying existing practices which are in place. Uh, we certainly have uh, Section 4 of our bill uh, that goes uh, to protecting uh, existing activities that are going on uh, to be able to codify those existing rights that are there to not be able to impair them. Uh, and this is legislation. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, for once the federal government uh, is not going to be able to step on those tribal rights, on our state rights, and those private property rights. Now, I appreciate that sentiment and that statement. And uh, to restate the obvious, that I suspect that means that uh, you and the chairman support the inclusion of the Mullen Amendment uh, in any rule and the opportunity to vote on that. Well, I'll yield to your wisdom, but then I would look favorably upon uh, that amendment if it got to the floor. I appreciate that very much. Now I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had uh, one question. I, I've read both pages of the legislation, and I, I'm willing to concede that uh, it is that its genesis uh, was in, in the extraordinary realization that the United States government believes that it can walk into a private business and say, in order for you to continue the business that you've been uh, performing generation after generation. You've got to give me all your water. In this case, it happened to be the ski areas uh, in your and, and uh, Mr. Polis's district. I, I can see that the genesis uh, was, was this outrageous behavior because who'd have thought? Maybe you guys in the West to deal with that all the time. Coming out of the Southeast, who'd have thought that you, the United States government would show up on your door one day and say, you know, Rob, as a condition for using your interstate highway, I, I need you to give me your car. Right? It's going to be my car from now on. I'll let you drive it, but it's going to be mine. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't imagine uh, that. And, and so I understand why folks would want to get together and solve that problem. But as I think about it, and, and Mr. Polis uh, raised it, uh, Mr. Hastings spoke to it directly, golly, if you can do it to the ski areas, why wouldn't you be able to do it to your ranchers? Why wouldn't you be able to go the next? The audacity that you, that, that whatever, uh, whatever that uh, sense of, of entitlement to what people own uh, is that comes out of, of the administration. If it begins here, where does it end? And I heard Mr. Polis's heartfelt concern. What, what, I, what I absolutely see is that you said you're, you're not just going to protect Mr. Polis's constituents. You're not just going to protect your constituents. You're going to make sure this never happens to anybody again, for which I am, am grateful. What I don't understand is why we can all come together around the fact that what the administration is proposing is outrageous, but we don't also come together around the fact that if you propose this same thing again, but just did it to somebody else in some other place, that that would be equally outrageous. Why doesn't that have the same uh, attraction in bringing us together uh, as the issue that Mr. Polis raised? For me, I, 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 and I appreciate the question, uh, this seems to me something that uh, as Americans, as Westerners, we ought to be able to rally around. And uh, frankly, if we go, uh, if the argument, and uh, you know, my good friend and colleague from Colorado uh, talked about the genesis at the beginning of this legislation, look back. There was no mention of just ski areas mm -hmm. uh, in the original legislation that he and I both endorsed and had our names on. This is something that we ought to be able to rally around. 
uh, in the interests of private property rights, something that's uh, incredibly important. If you believe in the Constitution, uh, in the Fifth Amendment, in terms of takings clause, that you've got to be paid if the federal government's going to step in and take something from you. Uh, this is something that uh, we certainly ought to be able to rally around. And uh, in terms of uh, some disparate views that are going to be there, I, I wish I had a great answer. Uh, this is something that as a Westerner uh, belies political lines. This is not a Republican. This is not a Democrat issue. Uh, this is an issue of right and wrong, private property versus taking. And uh, this is something that uh, we're trying to be able to achieve in a positive fashion with this uh, bill. You know, it, it, is, it is a shame. Uh, reputations uh, uh, matter, uh, and uh, as do stereotypes. And, you know, the Republican stereotype is not the reputation of a, of a concerned uh, member like yourself. It's a stereotype that you're out to, to do in the environment or this, that. Other folks don't realize Republicans come from areas where we love the environment because we're out there playing in them all day long every day. So I looked at your, your manager's amendment, and I just want to tell you how much uh, I appreciate uh, uh, it. You didn't have to, uh, but you did. Uh, and it, it, it has to put a lot of concerns uh, at ease. Uh, you said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to affect any reclamation uh, contracts. Let's just be clear, this isn't going to change anything in that area. The one that always comes up, Endangered Species Act. You're saying very clearly in your manager's amendment, nothing in this act shall affect the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. So too uh, on, uh, on water rights already reserved uh, for the federal government and uh, so too on the Federal uh, Power Act. I, 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 I hope folks back home know that it's, uh, when in the House it's easy to jam things through if you want to jam things through, uh, but it is, uh, it is better uh, to listen to people's concerns uh, and try to address those. Will the, gen will the gentleman yield wanted, for a moment? And I appreciate that. I'd be happy to yield for a moment. From Colorado. And just on that, on that last point, again, the bypass flow issue is not limited to the Endangered Species Act. Again, that is good language. One, it addresses one, of, <laughs> one little piece of that, but it does not address the issues related to the Forest Service, the BLM, Interior, or other agricultural agencies with regard to bypass flows and continues to leave those wide open uh, and I yield back. Uh, well, gentlemen, I'd be happy to yield to my friend from Utah. Um, do, you, do you mention bypass flow in more than one spot in this particular bill? No. Just the one spot that happens to be there. Let me, um, do you remember Tim Lowry? I do. Uh, testified before our committee, I yeah. believe it was referenced in committee. Rancher from Oregon, that from uh, the moment he got his ranch, there was a claim the federal government, federal government, not Forest Service, this is BLM, took upon his water rights, that after a decade long of a legal battle, he racked up $800,000 in legal fees before the Idaho Supreme Court ruled in Lowry's favor and against the federal attempt to hijack his privately held water rights. I'm sorry, we have gotten askew in some of the comments here. I just want the committee to realize not all ski resorts are in Colorado. The better ski resorts are in Utah. <laughs> Will the gentleman yield? No. Will the gentleman no. yield? No, I've, I've heard it long enough. And even though our counties have the same names, uh, the counties are saying different things in Utah, and that, and that despite the fact of whatever causes whatever to happen, the idea that we can have a rancher who can rack up $800,000 in debt, legal fees, because the BLM wants to take those rights away is preposterous. And that's why I want the entire bill in there, because it's more than just ski resorts. This is, do we actually believe people have a right to their own private property? And are they going to be treated with dignity by the federal government? And I think, Mr. Cole, you had a perfect example when you read part of that statement. As I read that statement, if that wasn't a more paternalistic approach, the federal government doesn't grant water rights to the Indian nation. They don't grant anything. They have the right to manage it. And I hate to say this, but in our hearing so far, they do a damn better job in managing their resources than the federal government does in those given states. So I appreciate that. I'm sorry. I yield back. Would the gentleman yield for a moment? Be happy to yield. Uh, because I certainly want to be able to speak to, to my good friend from Colorado's uh, concern when it comes to the, some of the bypass flows. And I don't know if you've had an opportunity yet to be able to review it, but again, I'll refer you to Section 4, Impacting on Existing Authority. 
Under the manager's amendment, it states that nothing in this act limits or expands any existing legally recognized authority of the secretaries to issue, grant, or condition any permit, approval, license, lease, allotment, easement, right-of-way, or other land use or occupancy agreement on federal land subject to their respective jurisdictions. So the concern that you are expressing is protected. We have the savings clause uh, that is put in to actually address specifically what your concern is. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, this has been the beauty of this legislation, actually, to be able to reach out to a variety of different interests. And my, my colleague had mentioned uh, Eagle County. Interestingly enough, Eagle County Sanitation District endorses this legislation. Uh, one of, one of your, your constituents out of your county, Colorado River Districts, which oversees the entire state of Colorado. Uh, Colorado Water Law, and I, I think uh, my, my colleague from Utah will certainly be able to speak to this as well. We have some of the most complex water law in the entire country, and uh, the age-old saying is whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, and we do. Uh, and this is a, a piece of legislation to make sure that we keep the fights at home and we aren't letting the federal government take it. I thank the gentleman for you. Okay. <laughs> I'd be happy to yield. Uh, thank you. Mind. Thank you, uh, Mr. Woodall. And, you know, we're talking in this bill, it is, um, the bill is centered on federal lands. It isn't private lands. Am I correct, mm -hmm. Mr. Polis? This is federal lands only. This affects only federal lands. The, the, uh, the, the bill we're talking about in regard to the skis, ski areas, they are federally owned. That's correct. So we're giving away uh, water rights so that somebody, if they sell the land, well, there's, they're allowing them to transfer the water. Then what is the point? We would want to be able to ensure, first of all, that the uh, uh, bill itself, do we want to protect the farm? If you want to protect the farmers and the ranchers, why include then the parks, the tribes, and the fish and wildlife? But this, we're not the, talking about the rights the federal government already has. We're talking about what they want to acquire by taking private property rights away. Well, I guess maybe it goes uh, a little bit further than that in, in terms of... That, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it is, it is troubling because Forest Service already said that they erred. In, in initially the, the directive, that they're changing that directive, that it's going to be not impacting the way we have discussed it. So we're, we're not going to wait to see if the directive uh, does address the issue or maybe uh, take the uh, Tipton Amendment so that it focuses only at this point on the uh, um, ski areas and the Forest Service and then deal with whatever water rights you feel are going to be impacted. The... the um, Western States Water uh, Council, uh, Western Governors Association, they are very uh, positive in their state. They, they quote, the states have pivotal role in allocating, administering, protecting, developing water resources. Uh, they would take, they're opposed to federal agencies that would adversely affect or interfere with state's primary role. Well, do we want to serve those state rights? I don't think so. Well, that's not what some of the agencies are saying that are coming to us and saying it is going to impact us as an, an, maybe an unintended consequence. Well, I, Would you? I appreciate uh, your, uh, your collective uh, uh, deep love uh, for the land and the people uh, who uh, work it, uh, in the case of ski areas, uh, uh, work it for our recreational uh, purposes, for the, for the, in the role of uh, some of our farmers uh, who work it so that we can uh, can feed our uh, families. I am uh, more certain than ever after three years with a voting card uh, that uh, it is apathy uh, that gets us into trouble, uh, vigilance, uh, irrespective of, uh, of, uh, of how much time is consumed by it, uh, uh, makes us all stronger. And I am, I am grateful for the collective uh, vigilance that, uh, that led to some action uh, here. And, you know, the one thing I can't stop for my constituency, uh, 
Mr. Tipton, I, I tell folks on the casework side, you never were successful on a case, it's a failure. Because someone deserves something, and they didn't get it when they should have gotten it, and now I've had to step in and, and make that better. What you are doing here by going beyond this one directive is you're making sure other folks don't have to struggle with this, don't have to end up uh, in litigation, as Mr. Bishop uh, uh, pointed out. You're, you're, you're taking a burden away from a family and from a business and from a community. It may not exist today, but folks certainly know it might uh, exist down the road, and I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to you for that. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields back to time. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate it. You know, we have so many ski resorts in Florida. Um, <laughs> so this was really never on our radar. And, and you know, uh, Mr. Woodall and I, our states join borders. We've had some issues on water over the years, uh, but Florida still seems to win at football games. So nothing against the state of Florida or Georgia on that. Uh, you know, some of the, the issues that you hear, and, and I, that's why I think this is good legislation, is that, yes, you know, the, the underlying issue brought it to the forefront, and that was as it relates to our ski resorts, uh, to your ski resorts and Mr. Polis's and those that have ski resorts in their areas. But, you know, the issue is much larger, and I think you hit on it when you talked about farmers and ranchers, because I have farmers and ranchers in my area. And water is of vital importance to them. And we have a lot of federally owned land in Florida, not as much as some states, because I know the, the West always talks about the number of acres owned. But in the state of Florida, the federal government owns and operates a large portion of the state. And in water in Florida is, is pretty essential. Uh, you know, we're covered by three sides, but it's not something that we can drink or or irrigate with, but it is important. And so it's almost like if you use the analogy that came up, well, it, it only, the diagnosis only showed that, you know, the initial diagnosis was, uh, it was related to just ski resorts, the issue of the federal government overreaching. Clearly, everybody agrees with that. But it would be like ignoring the other symptoms that are out there. The federal government, if it can overreach in one case, then why can't it overreach as it relates to water uh, and, and these agencies again um, in other areas? It just this time it won't be ski resorts. This time it'll be cattle ranchers. This time it'll be uh, aquaculture. It'll be anything that the federal government can control. So I think that while this may be broad, uh, sometimes it's, it's good to be broad, particularly when you're talking about particular rights, property rights, but, but rights that the federal government can intercede on and take away from people that I represent. I don't represent ski districts, but I do represent farmers and ranchers. So I think it's a, uh, an appropriate piece of legislation, and, uh, and I thank you, uh, even if you have an opposing view in regards to the broadness of it, but I, I do thank the committee for coming forward with this, Mr. Tipton. Will you yield, sir, for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Well, then, then why don't we address the most pertinent issue that is being brought forth by Mr. Polis, Mr. Tipton, and certainly Mr. Bishop on the ski resource within this, this scope of this uh, bill, the, the, the managers, the amendment by Mr. Tip, well, by uh, Mr. Polis, uh, and, and go to the debate and bring to the table those entities like yours that are going to be affected by maybe taking um, the federal government taking steps that sh they should not be um, determining what your what water rights you can take from from ranchers, from farmers, from uh, whatever entity there is. But that's a bigger issue, and let's discuss that. Let's be be well, honest. I we're claiming my time. I, I think that's what we are having a discussion. I think that's the discussion you had in committee. And correct me if I'm wrong, that is, like I said, the, the impetus for it was the ski resorts. But it, it grew because, and, and, and looking through the, you know, the windshield, looking forward, they said, hey, listen, if it's just this issue this time, is it going to be other issues as it relates to this particular issue? And, and, and Mr. Chairman, well, that, uh, have you heard of the uh, statement "canary in a gold mine" mm -hmm. or in a coal mine? Coal mine. This may be analogous to that as it relates to states' primacy on water law. 
it happened in one area and it's been repeated a number of times. And I, I, th I think you're right on and I think Mr. Tipton saw that in thus this legislation. But this is analogous from my, from my point of view to the canary in a, in a coal mine. That's, I think that's a perfect example. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I want to thank uh, our panel. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Orlando is recognized. The gentleman has no questions. Does the gentleman from Louisville, Texas seek recognition? Thank you very much. The uh, issue has been well discussed. I want to you thought. thank all three of you for attending today. I'm well aware that much more will be said. But I want to thank all three of you. And I would like to commend, if I can, the gentleman, Mr. Tipton, and the gentleman, Mr. Polis, for their ability and desire to speak about this difficult, testy issue in a professional way. And on behalf of the committee, I speak for all of us. Thank you very much to all three of you. And, and you're now excused. The uh, committee does not see any member seeking to give testimony. This closes. Excuse me. Mr. Polis, do you wish to... Uh, be recognized for the purpose of an amendment. Um, do I have uh, the rule? I'm sorry. I, my, your name is on yes, here as Mr. a possible Chair, yes. witness. Uh, I'll yes. be very brief. Uh, the gentleman's recognized. Yeah, we, we discussed my amendment with the other witnesses. I just want to see if my colleagues have any questions. Very essential. It would narrow the scope of this bill to the ruling uh, to address the actual issue that was the genesis of this bill, and I believe if this amendment was made in order and could pass the House, I would be proud to lend the final bill support, and I believe it would pass uh, with an overwhelming majority uh, if, if this amendment is included, as it would, uh, it would address the concerns that were voiced so capably by Ms. Napolitano and members of the minority, and I, I'm happy to yield the questions if there are any. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman? The yeah, gentleman from Georgia, if I could. We've talked a lot about the Polis Amendment. Uh, my reading is it's an amendment in the nature of a substitute. It's going to strike all of the language that, uh, that the committee has, has crafted and just replace it entirely with your language, and that that's what you would be willing to support on the floor? Uh, yes, it, uh, it, it, exactly. It, it replaces the scope of the bill with uh, limiting it to the, the issue that we hope to work with Mr. Tipton and, and Mr. Hastings on around the ski area directive. Uh, and I, I, cos I wanted to add that my co-sponsor, this is Ms. Delbeni from Washington State. I thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And there's six others. Six others are also co-sponsors of this amendment. I also had a question, and I hate to do this. You know, here we go again. But the if if you took the language that was in Mr. Tipton's bill, as opposed to the language that you have that is simply about the ski areas, isn't that just to protect status quo? His bill. Uh, no, across I, the board. Across the board. Uh, it affects the legal status uh, of the waters. But yes. It, it, but it, how does it harm jobs and job creation and other people if that's really yeah. asking for status quo? Well, again, uh, in terms of the use of a very limited resource that in our rivers, um, the recreation economy around fishing, whitewater rafting, uh, there could be times, look, we, we never know what the future brings in terms of snow and rain and future river flows. And uh, our sound uh, water policy needs to uh, sometimes make changes that allow for river byflows and uh, continued access to yes, resources. But how, so, can you, how can you yeah. take and say, all we're trying to do is extend the same protections? It's a, all this is a protection. How can you then make statements that say, well, this is going to harm the economy, this is going to harm jobs, this is going to harm, I, I don't want to quote it, I would love to, but I don't know, but that was the general direction. How could that be if what it's doing is providing protection for the same as the ski area? Well, again, that has been indicated to me by uh, the uh, many of the businesses in the counties that are directly impacted. So there's a greater this. trust on the federal government to manage than current status. Well, again, um, it's, there's a complex body of law around current status. Uh, this 
bill preempts the very complex status quo with the degree of simplicity which can work to the detriment of our local. Is that right? Economies. I thought it gave gave them standing. In, in, to no, I mean the reason that water. the reason that Mr. Bishop and others right. are seeking it is is it replaces a very complex uh, status quo with a simple, uh, overly broad clarification uh, that frankly uh, would change the the balance that exists between legitimate uh, uh, stakeholders in water rights. Okay, thank you very much. Seeing no further questions from the panel, I want to thank the gentleman for his uh, testimony. And Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman? This ge gentleman from Massachusetts yeah, recognized. And I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time, but yes, I'd like sir. to uh, submit for the record, uh, this is regarding H.R. 4015, the statement by Sheila Jackson Lee in favor of her four amendments. Without objection, that will be entered in the record. And I thank the gentleman very much. I've seen no further testimony. This now closes the hearing portion of H.R. 3189, the Water Rights Protection Act. And the chairman will be in, result, in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Utah. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 3189, the Water Rights Protection Act, a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committees on natural resources. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule makes an order as original text for the purpose of amendment. The amendment in nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Natural Resources now printed in the bill and provides that it should be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against the amend that amendment in the nature of a substitute. The rule makes an order only those further amendments printed in Part A of the Rule Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to an amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for a division of the question. The rule is all points of order against the amendments printed in Part A of the report. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2 of the rule provides for consideration of H.R. 4015, the SRG Repeal and Medicare Provider Payment Modernization Act of 2014, under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided among and controlled by the chairs and ranking minority members of the Committee on Energy and Commerce and the Committee on Ways and Means. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment printed in Part B of the Rules Committee report should be considered as adopted and the bill as amended should be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against the provision in, in the bill as amended. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction. Section 3 of the rule provides that on any legislative day during the period from March 17, 2014 through March 21, 2014, the journal of the proceedings of the previous day shall be considered as approved and the chair may at any time declare the House adjourned to meet at a date and time to be announced by the chair in declaring the adjournment. Finally, Section 4 of the rule provides that the speaker may appoint members to perform the duties of the chair for the duration of the period addressed by Section 3. Okay, so moved. Now I heard the uh, motion from the gentleman from Utah. I would defer to the gentleman from Louisville, Texas, for a description of the rule. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The rule provides for consideration of H.R. 3189 under a structured amendment process. It makes in order three amendments, including Mr. Polis's substitute, that will also receive extra debate time. The SGR bill will be considered under a closed rule. The rule will self-execute the camp amendment, which is necessary to bring the bill to the floor without a violation of the cut-go rule. The minority will, of course, receive the customary motion to recommit on both bills. The rule includes the customary district work period authority. This is a fair rule, and I urge support from all members and yield back. You've now heard the uh, motion from the gentleman from Utah and discussion from the gentleman from Louisville, Texas. Uh, I would now defer to anyone that would make uh, a discussion or amendment would defer first Thank to the gentlewoman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I follow my usual amendment here. Uh, I move the amendment grant H.R. 3189 and H.R. 4015 open rules so that all members would have the opportunity to offer amendments to the bills on the floor. You've now heard the uh, amendment by the gentlewoman from New York for the discussion. Seeing none, the uh, vote will now be on the slaughter amendment. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. No, have it. No, have it.
Further amendment or discussion? Yes. Gentlewoman's uh, well, recognized. I, I need a roll call. Oh, vote. gentlewoman is requesting a roll call. Pardon. I was waiting yes, to hear a great call out of nowhere. I didn't hear Dr. To. Burgess. Okay. But I do need a roll call on that. Gentlewoman requests roll call. Our, Ms. Fox. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Ross Leighton. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Uh, three yeas, seven nays. The amendment has not agreed to. Okay, well, now that we've polished off democracy, it has come to my attention. Yes, ma'am. That the right. self executed. Camp Amendment is non-germane. Uh, would you explain to me if we are making an order a non-germane amendment? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Well, in that case, I'd like to point out that I, as a, I hope, member of good standing of this Rules Committee and the ranking member for some time, that just last week was denied the ability to do a non-germane amendment to protect drinking water uh, for people from the mountaintop mining. And I would hope that, uh, that some uh, thing can be <coughs> found here that I think Mr. McGovern has a good idea for, so that we can, on this important bill uh, dealing with the SGR, that all of us can vote for it and maybe get a unanimous vote out of this House for a change and really do something that needs to be done to permanently fix it uh, without one more time just trying to vote against the health care bill. I would think you guys would be getting pretty tired of it, too. Uh, so, uh, I I'm, thank you very much for agreeing that what you are doing is putting in order a non-germane amendment. We appreciate the general. Very selective about that. I'm, let me add that as well. None of the rest of us can ever get anything like that done, even though it's perfectly within the purview of this committee. We uh, do appreciate and respect the gentlewoman for Sometimes. her. You know, I always do. Yeah. The gentlewoman does know that I've always encouraged and been open to hearing from her and giving her as much time as she chooses to make the points. But the reason we're here is that our side would like to make some law sometime and have something to do on the floor and have a vote on something that we're trying to do. It, you know, I, I've pointed this out before, but what, and when you do this, you're shutting out half the people in the United States on what their opinions are. And we have no debate on these bills uh, because the amendments that you won't let us have. It wouldn't have taken that much trouble last week on that bill to let us discuss the mountaintop removal and drinking water, which has become, again, talking all afternoon here about water. Well, uh, water I, is not only just important in the western part of the country. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there are times when you have the latitude to sit back and pontificate, and I'm not trying to do that right now. Uh -huh. What I would say to you is the policy I think is bipartisan support, the policy of the SGR. I think that. But it, the policy doesn't matter a hoot if the way you're going to pay for it. Well, but you do have to pay for it. Well, then why don't you do it correctly? And we're well, we're gonna we're gonna we're trying to find a way. I believe, and I can look at yeah. you straight and say, when this passes. It's going to give Mr. The, the Senate a chance to agree or disagree with us and do as they choose. You know, They've got their own problems over there also. And I'm sure they'll work you know, through them. The problems over here, though, are really mounting. To well, the, prob the, prob have... no, the problems are also 31 pieces of Democrat legislation that the United States Senate has not handled in addition to Hours. But but let's go. Well, that's let's, not the problem because you add yeah. to that problem because every week here you come up with two or three more. Well, we try and we try and think. First so, of all, we are not weary at all about look, passing. SGR is critically important. As long as I've been in Congress, you go. since we were trying our very best to get something done, you had a piece of legislation that came out of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee unanimously. But you don't want everybody to be able to vote for that, and you don't want to fix the problem, obviously, because you've attached to it. This pay for, which is a poison pill, if ever there was one, well, and you know it. How, how now, about how about we have if one you have one here before us this afternoon, Mr. Chair?
from Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts, which we'll have an opportunity to vote for. Mr. Tierney takes it from the overseas contingency money, and you could pay for it, and we would all vote for it, and the country would breathe a sigh of relief. And you know and so what? would the medical association. And you know what? Yes. I would say to you that might be exactly where the Senate comes from. We might go to a conference. We might come to an understanding, and then we'll yeah. know where we are. Well, let's but do it nothing. First. I well, think it's our you know. To do that first. Uh, let, let's let's just know this: that what we're trying to do, and I've done this in my brain, is you to separate them in your brain. I sure I, did. I, I think I, I read sure your did. Brain here pretty well. uh, <clears throat> you read my brain because I we have worked you hard. Got, you got this Dr. Program, Burgess, which you separate completely from the pay for. Well, but no. nobody else can do that. We're not capable of what I well, well I, the gentleman may not be, for, but but the people that went to hard work like. Let's say Mr. Green, and I know Dr. Burgess has worked for years and years and years, but he doesn't sit on ways and means. But, Mr. Chairman, it didn't take any great brains and a lot of time to come up with this last night at 720. Would the gentlelady yield for just I one would. second? I, I don't control the time, but certainly. Oh, well, the ge gentleman was recognized would. then. Would the gentleman yield? Ge the gentleman. Who actually controls the time? Uh, you know what? I'll say I do. Okay. And now I would defer to the gentleman from Utah. Just trying to confuse the situation a little bit more. I appreciate your comments about the Tierney Amendment. Mm -hmm. The sad part is that's not a proper offset. CBO has already said that fun future funding of overseas contingency would not have a scorable budgetary impact. That would not impact direct spending and revenues. It would not satisfy our cut-go rules. So as much as you'd like to have that as an option, we can't use that as an option. Uh but I, so I would, so it would be wise if we would at least go forward with this process, take it up, get the bill over there, start the negotiations with the Senate. May I respond? Yeah, Mr. Does gentleman, Mr. Bishop, may I respond? Does gentleman yield back his time? I'll yield my time to you because it's your time. The gentleman yields so back his can. time. The chairman does control the time, and the gentleman would now defer to the Thank ranking. Thank you so much. But I, we are the rules committee. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and we, uh, when we want to. We make everything non-germane uh, in order. We care to do that, and we can do the same thing with that. Uh, and I and I just say once again, or that do the by, same by thing putting with the one on the fifty-first vote to destroy the health care and to take health care away from people is no way to fund anything in this Congress. And I yield back the, my time to you, Mr. Chair. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. So we are to the point, and I would like to see if we can figure no, this out, that if we'll Rogers. just hold on just no, a minute, that we have now voted on and did not agree to the slaughter amendment, mm -hmm. so we're still in discussion and debate, and the gentlewoman did take that time, and we're glad that she did. Does anyone else yeah. seek additional time? And the gentleman from Massachusetts is now recognized. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for the amendment by Representative Tierney number 4, which would provide a responsible permanent fix of the sustainable growth rate, SGR, of Medicare that is paid for by capping spending on overseas contingency operations. And if I could just be heard briefly, um, I, I, I think, you know, what I want to make sure everyone understands here, um, and, and uh, the ranking member uh, asked you this um, at the outset, and that is the uh, offset that, that is being self-executed is technically not germane. Um, it doesn't belong here, in other words. Uh, but the Rules Committee is going to self-execute it so that it will become part of this overall bill. So this issue of germaneness and waivers and all this other kind of stuff that people like to throw up, um, you're using it to your advantage. And every once in a while, we'd like to get you know, uh, in the action, too. Uh, and be able to offer what we believe are appropriate offsets. And rather than a couple of people in this room making the decision for this entire House, how about letting the 434 or five members of this House that we have right now, um, why, don't we let, uh, why don't we let them decide it for one, once, once in a while? And what's becoming you know, really quite un unacceptable uh, is the fact that, um, and we're, first we're dealing with the closed rule, um, so we're totally shut out. Uh, on this, uh, but um, you know, good ideas offered by the minority are routinely rejected. You have the power to do that, um, and you are doing it, uh, but we don't think it is right, and so that's why we're complaining. And the SGR uh, bill before us was uh, developed and agreed to in a bipartisan manner. Absolutely correct. But we will never have an opportunity to vote on that bipartisan product. 
we will only be able to vote on this product that you have amended with an offset that we find uh, uh, unacceptable. Uh, and with members like Dr. Burgess and Mr. Waxman, who have, are traditionally opposed um, at opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to health care reform, coming together and agreeing that this bill is an, our, our best bet to replace the Medicare payment formula with a new and better system, that's a, that's a good thing. But instead, we are, we are playing politics that could hurt countless uh, uh, numbers of Americans and weaken the fabric of our Medicare system. Look, there are, our new, there are our innumerable options that could serve as a non-controversial pay for, such as the one offered by Mr. Tierney today. Uh, but of course, the way this whole process has been rigged uh, is that uh, we won't have that option to debate those. Uh, and instead, I regret that you've chosen an option that would certainly uh, sink this bill um, unless it was dramatically changed. So I see no reason why Mr. Tierney's amendment cannot be made in order, given what is going on here right now, and I would urge my colleagues to vote for it. I yield back my time. Further discussion? I think the committee has had time this afternoon to consider not only the ramifications, but they've heard the numerous arguments about that. Those in favor of the McGovern Amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Noes have it. I ask for a roll call, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, ask for a roll call vote. Ms. Fox. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Ross Leitman. No. Ms. Ross Leitman, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Slaughter. Yes. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report. Those. Three yeas, eight nays. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. Further discussion or amendment? Gentleman from Colorado. I wanted to thank the chair for including the amendment that I offered along with Mr. Gett, Mr. Perlmutter, Mr. Benny, Ms. Custer, uh, Mr. C uh, Ms. Cartwright, and Mr. Huffman uh, in the um, uh, to the floor. Uh, I deeply appreciate that. We have a SGR fix, and I'm going to call my amendment the H2O fix. So I appreciate that we'll be able to discuss the H2O fix on the floor and hopefully uh, fix some of the uh, flaws in the legislation, and I yield back. <laughs> Jim and yields back his time. Uh, so now the uh, vote will now be on the motion from the gentleman from Utah. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Gentlewoman asked for a roll call vote. Ms. Fox, Mr. Bishop. Yes. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Nugent. Aye. Mr. Nugent, aye. Mr. Webster. Yes. Mr. Webster, aye. Ms. Ross Leitonen. Aye. Ms. Ross Leitonen, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Slaughter. No. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Polis. No. Mr. Polis, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk report total. Eight yeas, three nays. The uh, motion is agreed to. The gentleman from Louisville, Texas will be handling this for Republicans. <coughs> Mr. Paulus from Colorado. And the gentleman from Colorado. This uh, is expected to be the last meeting of the week. This closes the hearing. I want to thank everyone for their attendance. Thank you.